absolute certs in there then can only help your, your chances and England will more than likely be in a penalty shootout because they always are How important are the League Cup matches last night do you think? What 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 focus should we place on them? Why are they important and uh, of what? Well if you saw City's <coughs> starting team you're thinking well there's a few strong players in there but then you see their bench and you're thinking okay well if City are 1 or 2 nil down in this game they're going to bring on the cavalry. They're going to bring on Haaland and De Bruyne because they've won it four times under Pep. Yes, yeah, so Pep, Pep loves to win Pep, it. Pep obviously thinks there's something in the, like the culture of winning the League Cup. He wasn't, I think Mourinho was the same, wasn't he? Yeah, he always, trophies. It's just trophies. Well, it, you, know, you get to add an extra finger when you're like, you know... This is how many trophies I yeah. won. Uh, no, I, I think it's a good thing. I think, I think a push. Like, for example, you look at United, United versus Villa tonight and... I, you know, as a United fan, you want them to push on to win a trophy because we just have we don't win trophies anymore. Um, but Villa are, a, well, sorry, Unai Emery is a cup man, so he's going to go all out tonight. He's had a week. He he's had a we week. Can't but expect him to do too much in a week. And he's, well, he has he United's number already, doesn't he? Can't be picking the same team that he picked at the weekend. No, maybe he can because there's only two games before. You yeah, know, yeah, maybe yeah. You can pick your full team for this. Exactly, it's kind of different than than it ordinarily would be. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I think there should be a focus placed on it. Liverpool were were lucky to to scrape through last night. But then again, that's how they've done it. You know, even last year they did it and, and scraped through and penalty shoot out in the final itself. Um, I think I think managers are playing placing more of an emphasis in the League Cup now than they used to be, um, because of that thing. Because trophies are important because they need to get that name on their list on their Wikipedia page. Uh, and and you look at some of the, the starting lineups last night, not bad. And yeah. still a few shocks as well. Spurs are out. Yeah, Spurs are out. So City beat Chelsea by two goals to nil last night. Um, I think maybe for Potter it was more important than it was for Pep. Is, is uh, I'm going out on a limb here with a hot take this morning that uh, Potter needs some wins urgently in a way that um, Pep Guardiola might have a bit more credit in the bank. Yeah, what well, like. If you're if you're Green Potter, you're thinking right. This started this started very well at Chelsea, yeah, and all right. of a sudden you have the Brighton game recently. And We're, we'll talk a bit more about this in, in a minute because I've, <coughs> I've buried the lead. The biggest story in world sport happened in the last twenty four hours. Yes, what happened? Jimmy White. Jimmy White. The whirlwind. Uh, he changed his name to Jimmy Brown for money. Remember he did. That? Anyway, we'll, he did. we'll skip over that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James White. Uh, yeah, it was for Brown Sauce Company, wasn't it? HP. Um, yeah, HP. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. are other brand sauces, but other, that's yeah. the best. Yeah, chef's we all know it. No, Chef is best. Um, so he last won the UK Championship 30 years ago, Jimmy White. He's now 60 years of age. Um, yesterday, we were talking about him yesterday in the show, but he still had a qualifier to go against Dominic Dale, who's a good player. He beat him 6 1. He kicked his ass, basically, Jimmy White last night. Uh, that to follow up the win against Stephen Maguire, who's a brilliant player, and then a, white, a couple of whitewash wins as well against lower opposition. Uh, he's the the last player in age in their sixties to reach the UK Championship proper was Eddie Charlton in nineteen ninety three. I mean, Jimmy White first competed in this tournament back in eighty one. Wow. Um, Neil Robertson tweeting yesterday saying this is one of the greatest achievements ever in our sport. The fact that someone can at this, at this age reach the tournament proper and the UK Championship is one of the Triple Crown events along with the World Championships and the Masters it's one of Snooker's top events the York uh, the Barbican Theatre in, the, in York next week is when, when it happens Sean Murphy I think he's drawn uh, Sean oh, Murphy right. of, of this parish of Dublin um, so that'll be an interesting match um, but I, like the, you cannot I cannot describe what this achievement means it's it is akin to Roger Federer well into his 40s Diving into a you know a Wimbledon championship. No, it's akin to Federer in his fifties. Coming back, sorry, fifties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's, he's like basically already in his fifties. He 40s. essentially is in his fifties. Yeah, sorry, he's a freak. <laughs> uh, like it's it's probably like I don't know what how it compares to other sports, but you know, Patrick Harrington pushing in a major right now in his early fifties. Yeah, I still don't think it's the same. It's better. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, yeah. Because like Tom Watson nearly won the Open and he was a, a gazillion. Yeah, well that's fair. Uh, like and Jimmy White's sixty, but he's playing so well at the minute. Like he, he takes part in the World Senior Championships. He won it in twenty nineteen and twenty. He's lost the last couple of finals. Um, but you know, right. you, you kind of thought. But the thing about Jimmy White's, we'll get him on. Go on. He, he still thinks he can win. Well, I mean, the only way to lull yourself into getting into the zone well, yeah. is to go. Oh, I'll have a chance here. But you look at Stephen Hendry playing at the minute, and he can't. He can't strike a ball. Well, they need to find his broken cue. Well, this is it as well. Yeah. So find his last cue. Right. It's seven forty. You're very welcome along to OTBAM. Ben Jacobs is standing by. We're going to talk to him right now. Tomas O'Leary is going to talk to us about Munster this evening against uh, South Africa selection at a park uh, full parky Cueve sports pages at half eight this morning Craig Hope is going to talk to us about Newcastle specifically at 8.50 Gemma O'Connor is going to talk to us about her new book at ten past nine and we'll hear from Noel Mooney ex-FAI interim chief executive who is now in charge of the Welsh FA and um winning rave reviews for his job there so anyway at 7.40 I'm delighted to say Ben Jacobs is with us Ben good morning to you how are you? Good morning how are you? Um, let's start with 
Graham Potter and, and Chelsea and um, this little difficult moment he's having, I guess for him, the break can't come soon enough. There is the small matter of Newcastle before the break happens though, which uh, I think is going to have a lot to do with the mood music that the four-week break has around Stamford Bridge. I agree with you. We're still comparatively early in the season because we won't have all of the usual festive fixtures, but this game at St. James's Park feels pivotal for both Chelsea and Newcastle as well in the race for top four. But from Potter's perspective, it's going to set the tone because uh, Chelsea with another loss or even arguably that failed to win enter into the international break because of the World Cup. And they know that January is going to be essential. And suddenly there's a lot of time to linger on whatever happens at St. James's Park. And I think there was such a golfing class between Chelsea and Arsenal. And then the Brighton result was a heavy defeat as well. And a stark reminder to Graham Potter of exactly the task at hand. And naturally, you can look at Chelsea as a long term project. But Graham Potter is on one of the worst runs at the football club period because Chelsea don't lose a string of games and you have to go back two or three years to find this kind of lull in form. So Graham Potter is not under pressure in terms of his imminent future at Chelsea, but if they can head into that World Cup break with a win at St James's Park, then suddenly that's a momentum builder. If they lose that game, then it only illustrates how much work needs to be done in January. They've had their injuries with Wesley Fofana and Reese James. They've had the expected, but I think still unfortunate incident of Romelu Lukaku going to Inter. And that, of course, created a necessity to find more goals. And then someone like Raheem Sterling just hasn't clicked in a new position. So you can tell what Graham Potter's trying to do, but he's going to have to do it quickly and get something against Newcastle. Otherwise, Chelsea are obviously going to have a long, long period to linger over the fact that there's a very realistic possibility that they're not going to make the top four. One of the underrated things that maybe um, we forget sometimes in football is about the team dynamics, the dressing room, the importance of all that kind of stuff. We, we, we kind of underplay it. It's like, well, a good manager's going to come in and just make sure everybody believes him. And, and uh, But with a couple of defeats when you're trying something new, it's easy for ill feeling to foment. And uh, if, if you're you know somebody who has come in on big money, who's used to winning like Raheem Sterling, and things aren't going well for you, and suddenly you're dropping out of the England team, perhaps, at a World Cup. It's not great for team morale. And I, I don't know anything specifically about him, but I'm just using that as an example. And you can see how that could spread relatively quickly in a changing room. So it's not like he's under pressure from the hierarchy, but it, I'd say he must be feeling some pressure from his team to, like, we're a really good team, full of players who've won literally everything that there is in the game. What's going on here? Why are we losing to Brighton? Why can't we compete at the level that we're used to competing? Yeah, and I think a lot of that is down to the turmoil at the club, both good and bad. Ultimately, Chelsea came off the back of sanctions, a very speedy sale that impacted the club in terms of transfer windows because they couldn't move in January. They didn't know where they would stand towards the beginning part of the summer. And then Todd Bowley and Berdag Egbali from the majority owner Clear Lake Capital have come in and they've changed the board. They've assumed titles within recruitment. And Thomas Tuchel obviously got sacked as well. And the backdrop behind a lot of the exits was also due to some of the things that I've mentioned as well. So Antonio Rudiger said very openly he'd have loved to stay at Chelsea, but nobody was able to come back to him and offer him a contract because of the situation. So he went elsewhere. And even someone like Cesar Aspilicueta, who stayed, spent a lot of the summer thinking about leaving. Romelu Lukaku, I've already mentioned as well. And when you have that kind of dressing room, of senior players, some of which know they're outgoing and others that wanted to be outgoing but didn't get a move and now are still at the football club. Yes, they've kind of U-turned. Yes, it's their decision to stay. But it can be very difficult to find that chemistry and solidity because if you're any of the other players, you don't really know what's going on. Christian Pulisic, for example, didn't really get on with Thomas Tuchel. And if a right offer came in, would have been open to a move. And now he has to kind of redefine himself, much happier under Graham Potter. But once again, it's a player forced psychologically to think about an exit and then remain at the football club and then add to that a new manager, a new system, a new ownership group, a new model 
new incomings on the recruitment side and the whole football club is just in transition it's a very ambitious transition it's a very positive transition but there's going to be teething problems and then if you look at fresh blood which always helps in this kind of context Raheem Sterling is in a different position he's being asked at times to play wing back Reese James Wesley Fafana have found themselves injured Dennis Zakaria comes in and has struggled for minutes, even though when we've seen him, he's looked relatively impressive at times. Amando Broya is told that he's got a big future, but doesn't start every game. Aubameyang was a Thomas Tuchel signing. So you can see the pattern here that not every player quite fits yet into the model and the mentality that's being built. And that's going to take time. But unfortunately, because they're Chelsea Football Club, they need results imminently. That, uh, that new model that you mentioned, Ben, you know, the, the new board, the new personnel involved, the new ownership. Uh, like, the quote struck me from, from Graham Potter this week where he said, I would say it's a little bit unfair to assess Chelsea now because the change of ownership has happened. We're on a new direction, a new path, and ultimately that is part of the challenge. Like, does he have an indefinite excuse here, an indefinite leash because of the new ownership, do you think? I don't think an indefinite leash, but certainly he's entitled to get through a full season and stamp his mark. And I think beyond that, even if Chelsea don't make the top four, there'll of course be fan outrage and questions being asked. But my understanding remains that this ownership group will be patient. It is very easy at the moment to see them as impatient because within a couple of months, they've changed almost everything. But now they've made their decisions. I think Graham Potter was seen as a fit and a fit for building a model and also a fit for working within a new way of recruiting specifically for Chelsea, regardless of that broader multi-club model. And with Thomas Tuchel, the problem was not his pedigree or his talent as a coach. It was his relationship with Todd Bowley and Bed Ed Barley. And they fell out during pre-season. And Thomas Tuchel didn't like how closely the owners, whether they had their owner hat on or their recruitment hats on, were involved within the football, whereas Graham Potter is quite happy to see what Chelsea are building and allow some kind of control and power to others with on this so-called recruitment team, which is obviously still being built. And in that context, he's the right fit. So naturally, if Chelsea just keep losing a string of games, how many can you lose before you are sacked? That's just football. But it's far too early and unfair on Graham Potter to be thinking on those terms because we've only seen flashes of what he can do. But this, again, is part of the appeal of Potter, but also the risk of Potter. The appeal comes in his affability and in his man management and in his desire to build the club model. But the risk comes in the fact that he's never managed a club of this stature. So if you had a manager that already had the pedigree and things weren't going right, then perhaps fans in particular would say, we understand what you're trying to do and we'll give it time. But some will say, if Chelsea keep on losing, that Potter specifically, because of that inexperience at a club like Chelsea, is to blame. And that adds even more pressure. Yeah, so I think it's unfair, but it's just the reality of football. No, it's a really interesting situation that they find themselves in. And um, yeah, I think people wish him well. Uh, one thing you mentioned there, Aubameyang obviously was a specifically a, a, a Tuchel signing um, at what point do we begin to see the club making signings that are based on the style of play that they want to implicate on a week in week out basis I guess at what point do we start to see a plan to the signings I think the plan in terms of the signings was actually there before Graham Potter in the sense that Chelsea need to sign out of necessity. So you could make an argument that Graham Potter would have enough for his style and his plan if everybody was fit, but they're not. And again, that's football and it's partially down, no doubt, to the congested fixture calendar as well. So Rhys James, Wesley Fofana would obviously be integral at the back. And then Romelu Lukaku had already gone because of his relationship with Thomas Tuchel to Inter long before Potter came in. And yes, they got Aubameyang, but there's other targets and Kunku being one of them. But the plan ultimately is and was that Chelsea need a defender more and also need to significantly revamp their midfield. And then if they can get a planned striker over the next window or two, then Graham Potter will have the depth 
and talent. So the specific names may change, which is why, for example, Kai Sado in midfield will come into the mix because he was there at Brighton with Graham Potter. But Edson Alvarez is one to watch out for in January. Declan Rice is one to watch out for next summer. Chelsea will enter the race for Jude Bellingham as well. And then Denzel Dumfries could easily be a Chelsea target again at the back. And these positions, at least, were always on the radar. And Graham Potter fully backs that. And then the broader plan, the longer term plan, is to add youth into Chelsea that can be developed over time, both through the football club and when they get it via a multi-club model. And that will obviously allow them to invest in players earlier on longer term contracts. And if they come through, then that's cost okay. effective and you've secured young talents early. And yeah. if they don't come through, you can still sell them on for a profit. Well, that makes sense. Um, I guess that's the... the um what City have managed to do uh, with some of their players coming through and it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves over the next few years as well so on balance um, the hierarchy at Chelsea are relatively patient they'd like to see some uh, results but it does it does definitely make this Newcastle game really really important even in, in the race for the top four now is there a world in which they don't qualify for the Champions League and the hierarchy still says okay Potter we, we you know we're, we're not very pleased with this but we're going to stick with you. I think it will depend on the success of the January window. At the moment, Potter is unsackable, and that's because he's brand new to the job. And they told him when he joins that, of course, top four was the target, but they wouldn't just wield an axe if they didn't make it across one season because they believe that Graham Potter can turn things around. But it's all about the manner in which Chelsea do or don't qualify for the top four. And quite clearly, if they just keep losing games and they're miles off the top four and they feel like it's down to Graham Potter not evolving to how Chelsea work and also how their model develops, then that's one thing. Yeah. And ultimately, we don't know how that's going to pan out. But right now, the relationships behind the scenes are very good between Potter and Todd Bowley in particular. And all of these new recruitment heads are still coming into the football club. But again, you have to look out for, in January in particular, what Potter is armed with. Because if three or four players of quality come in and Chelsea have a bigger window than most, and they will have played less games comparative to usually a busy festive period, then they'll have plenty of time to turn things around. And then if they get to the end of the season and Chelsea are not in the top four, then Graham Potter assumes more of the accountability because he's had a January window and he's been backed. Whereas right now it's Thomas Tuchel's window and it's Thomas Tuchel's side and it's an injury hit side and it's a new model and it's a new ownership group, which is why there's no danger that Graham Potter is going to go at this point. But it's all about the manner, as I say, in which they either do or don't qualify for the top four. And no doubt that will be assessed come the end of the season. Uh, ben, Nathan Jones was, was watching Southampton beat Sheffield Wednesday last night on penalties in the, in, in the League Cup from, from the crowd. And I know he takes charge for the first time at Anfield on, on Saturday. No better way to start off your tenure uh, as a Premier League manager. Um, for maybe people who haven't been watching his Luton side in the championship and aren't familiar with him, he's got the, the dreaded highly rated tag. But, but what can people expect when he takes charge of Southampton? I think that he's a very passionate manager. He's a tactician. He obviously reached a playoff final, which he lost with Luton, which was an incredible achievement. He'd also got them promoted up to the championship as well. So all of the stuff we've seen from Luton is very positive. I think the only question mark is around that unsuccessful nine months in charge when he went to Stoke in 2019 and then he was sacked and ended up going back to Luton in May of the following year. And Luton at the moment, a ninth in the championship, it's obviously a very tight division, so they're only a couple of points off the playoffs. So I think Southampton fans will be hoping he makes that transition up to Premier League football. And he's been appointed because Southampton believe that he's a motivator. He's somebody very capable of being versatile in terms of his tactics. He will get Southampton disciplined and they also believe if a dogfight is necessary and that is looking likely at the moment from Southampton's perspective then he's the right man for the job but it's going to be really difficult and I think one of the key reasons why they like him is because Southampton have got a lot of youth 
coming through. Everybody obviously talks about Lavia, Bazunu, the goalkeeper as well, Larios, the fullback too. And this was all part of a strategy by Hassan Hootal to some extent, but also Joe Shields, who obviously only had a short tenure at Southampton as their director of recruitment and then ended up leaving for Chelsea. And Shields tried, because he'd come from Manchester City, to bring in youth and give Southampton a future in terms of box office young talent, Lavia being the main one, that could really help Southampton play a more attractive style of football and have consistency over six or seven seasons with the talent that they bring to the football club. And then obviously Shields left and Hassan Hootel kind of fell out with him and felt like the side was too young and lacking in experience. And Broyer had ended his loan spell at Southampton and gone back to Chelsea. And Che Adams, even though he has some potential, hasn't really been a huge source of goals. And Romeo obviously isn't there either. So there's a few problems that Jones is going to have to inherit, but the main one is that he's going to have to get the best out of a lot of young players and quickly, otherwise Southampton can be in big, big trouble. So it's a risk-reward appointment, really. It's a manager that doesn't have Premier League experience but has all of the right attributes as a coach to get Southampton out of trouble. Yeah, I, I, some good team is <clears throat> is going to get sucked into the relegation battle because it's the first time in many years where you can't automatically say that team and that team are going down and even the teams who are in the relegation zone could be relatively big spenders uh, in the uh, January transfer window and also who knows what the hell is going to happen with regards to the players who go to the World Cup and what kind of physical and mental state they're going to come back in so um, there's a lot up for grabs at the moment one last thing I know you've been looking at the uh, World Cup squads um, particularly the uh, American players who are going but is there anything that strikes you from um, the last 24-48 hours as the squads start to come out about which of these teams is in better health or worse health than we might have thought uh, six months out 12 months out. I think the French squad was relatively expected. And I think it's interesting because they've got quite a high average age, but a lot of that comes from a kind of Mandana, Lloris, Benzema, and so on. But Yusuf Fafana is in there. Chuameni is in there. Kavaminga is in there. And that, to me suggests that the younger players, particularly those that four years ago were not in the mix, are really going to stand up and help France continue to dominate. So that's going to be very intriguing for me. And even though people will kind of talk about Mbappe, I'm more interested with the French squad around some of those young players that I've mentioned and how many minutes they play, especially the midfielders and how integral they can be. Because France sometimes are quite nonchalant in World Cups. They get going reasonably slowly and they won't have that ability, I don't think, in this World Cup. Because anyone that starts tired, anyone that starts on the back foot, anyone that has a little wobble, any squads that pick up a little bit of an injury, I think the damage is going to be more intensified in a mid-season World Cup. And therefore, there'll be a lot of pressure on the more disciplined defensive midfielders playing for France to kind of keep the shape and ensure that the more creative players around them have that space and freedom to do the damage that we know that France can do. All right. Argentina is obviously a really interesting one as well, uh, simply because Scaloni's done a really good job and has brought in a few fresh faces. So I think even though South American sides don't traditionally travel well to away cups, uh, they can't be discounted. And then just briefly on uh, America, I was a little bit disappointed that Tim Ream wasn't called up, but it's clear that he was just sort of seen as a little bit uh, too old comparative to other options. It's good to see Cameron Carter Vickers in there. He's had a good season with Celtic. I don't think it was a big surprise that James Sands wasn't involved. There were a lot of other options in that position. So the only one within the American squad that was a surprise to me, a real surprise to me, uh, was no Pepe, who is young. And yet again, there were other options. I think he did enough and I think he would have been a good uh, addition. 
the US, but it's much the squad that we expected there. And obviously their game against Wales in particular is going to be key to deciding whether they or the Welsh can get out. Ben, good stuff. Great to have you with us again. Thanks a million. Cheers. All the best. It's uh, Ben Jacobs there. Um giving us his thoughts on situations around the league. The uh, the USA one is an interesting one because everyone is assuming and and like that that group USA, Wales, England, Iran, ever like even speaking to Neville Southall told me that he he thinks he thinks Wales can beat England in that group. Now, look, there's obviously Welsh bias there, but I mean, there's a good chance of course, there's <clears throat> a good chance England do normal boring two draws and a win in the group stages and through. get out. But there's also a chance that like it explodes. The US team, like if you're looking, he, like uh, Ben mentioned the US squad there, Cameron Carter-Vickers, Serginho Dest for AC Milan in, in the defence. You've got the couple of Leeds lads, Brendan Aronson, Tyler Adams as well, who are playing really well. Uh, like, there, it's not, it doesn't go against the grain of normality that you could see USA beating England in the World Cup because there's a lot of hype they have the next World Cup, of course, as well. They'll want to get a, a decent showing in this one. I, I don't know. I, um, I can see some mad things happening in that group. Uh, like it's, I think it's Wales, England on the last the last of the group games so it should be set up nicely but um, yeah I just uh, I, ca- I can't see England you think England are coming under the radar I know you and uh, like you've said that before that they could cause something uh, I, I think <clears throat> every range of outcomes on the table for England like they could easily blow up they could combust or, or go far mm. essentially yeah um, I think that the, the former option is, is more likely there I think they could combust in this World Cup like uh, I just feel like it's coming to the end of uh, of the Southgate era and this is the last cry of a dying animal. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't heard that many people talk about France and their young players. Like, of course, Mbappe is 23, turns 24, mm. like the week of the World Cup final. Um, you know, a crowning, a crowning glory to win a second. Yeah, and what a time to do it in his prime. But, like, their form in the Nations League was brutal. Um, not that form necessarily matters. I, like, but I think in this World Cup, nothing matters except how you deal with the heat in Qatar. I, I've ne- I, I can't remember a World Cup where everyone is writing off the European teams so so willingly and willy nilly because everyone's looking at Brazil or Argentina. It's I, I haven't heard anyone predict either one of those two to win it. Like it's Brazil or Argentina. Anyone other than those two? Yeah. Yeah. Well. There's still a week for people to make their minds up. It's two minutes past eight this morning, OTBAM, brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. We'll be unveiling ours next week, right? That's that's what's happening. Which, the the most? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Just shave all off in one go. Uh, Carl Doherty says, you should do a segment on the greatest achievements by ageing sports people. Adrian Barry doing the swim part of the triathlon has to be right up there. Yeah, it was a full, what was it, 250 metre swim? (laughs) <laughs> seven seven minutes in the water, still an achievement. It is no look uh, any um, you know they do they do literally hand out participation medals because it, you do deserve them if you do the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, you did the whole thing. I did the whole thing, of yeah. course. Yeah. I mean, only the greats, Jer, myself, and yourself, and who else? There was one other maybe. Ashley did it, and Tommy did. She did, yeah. yeah. The two of them did, yeah. Which is fair. Uh, we've got a, I've got a message in from Enda Call, formerly of this parish. England will be fine. Get on the Canada hype train. They're building something much better than the USA, and they've got a great side for this one. Well, Kevin Caban's on that train already. I was going to say, someone's, someone's drinking the Caban Kool-Aid. Yeah, well, I'd love to see a team like that do it. I, I, I had Denmark as my dark horses to go far, but I, don't, I actually don't think you can call Denmark dark horses anymore. Uh, well, maybe you can. To, to, to get the, I think they could get to a final and possibly, possibly one step further. Wow. We'll see. Uh, Keller needs to get first-team football soon for his own development, says Chris Cal. I don't know. I think he seems to be developing okay at a club where... World class stuff is happening, you know. He is coming up against Mo Salah in training every day. But he has to have the, this conversation has to happen soon, sooner rather than later. I get that argument that he's every day in training, he's learning and this and that. But his peak is going to be between twenty seven and thirty five. Yeah. So keep accumulating information, knowledge, money, caps, and uh, and then be ready. But like there's, there's a reason why he can't get ahead of Bazunu in, in the national team. Because he's not playing, yeah, but playing. but it's a long, long, long career. Yeah, but does he not want to look back now and say, right, I was in? He's he's in a. He might not be in his prime right now, but he's in a prime. He's still playing brilliantly, uh, brilliantly well. Yeah, he might not be better than Bazzino, even with all that though. Like, there's a chance that Bazzino is one of the best goalkeepers in the world. He's in the Premier League at that age, and very few goalkeepers make it that far that quickly. We just don't know until Kelleher plays regular first team Premier League football. Like, unless he joins a Leicester or a Southampton and starts playing regular football, then we'll never know. I don't know. I think he need. I think he needs the move. I, I, like I, I was fully on board with the let's learn at Liverpool. Let's let's keep him going there for a while. But it's got to the stage now where I think he needs. He needs something else. It's time for the next step, Jer. 
you can't just keep saving League Cup penalties and, and expect more international caps off the back of it. He's still very young. Is my, he is my, young. Yeah, so is yeah. uh, so Pazuno, I suppose. Yeah. Hasten softly. It's five minutes past eight. The big news coming through from rugby yesterday was that Tyke Furlong is going to play this week against Fiji, but not just that. He's going to be uh, Ireland captain for the first time in his career. First time he's captained a senior team. He said he was a captain at underage. I'd say he must have been the GA captain as well. You've all surely by now seen the YouTube footage of him um, being a, a free-flowing centre back half back midfielder slash half forward you know that the big lad in the GEA team who plays every position Ah, uh, you just get out of his way the barreler of the team yeah there's, there's a great he scores a goal at the end of that doesn't he, I think, the, well, he, he certainly, the one I'm thinking of he just absolutely nails somebody rolls someone yeah. just knocks him into a different dimension yeah I think that, does he go on finish I don't know certainly in your head you were like well I wonder what happened there no I know exactly what happened there yeah. he kept going yeah a, a big left boot on it but anyway he was asked I'm sure look we'll play you the clip have a look at this never even thought of it I would never even put the idea. Do you know when you dream as a young fella, you want to play for Ireland, you want to play for Leinster, you want to play for Lions? I never even dreamed of uh, Captain Ireland. What did you dream? Spuds, gravy, <laughs> mother's, mother's Sunday roast. Uh, <laughs> no, um, playing, just playing for Ireland. You know what I mean? It was never, never on the radar, to be honest with you. And look, I know it's for a game. I know it's, you're not captain of your country. Um, as in week in, week out, but it's still, it's still class, you know what I mean? It's still a class feeling, it's still, I know from people back home to be very proud, etc. so it's great. Do you think that's why you're um, as successful as you are? Obviously you have so much talent, but having this attitude of just sort of not having too much pressure on yourself and just going out and play? No, I, like, I don't know if I come across that way, but you would, I do put pressure on myself to play well, you know? Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot in that area, so... Um, I'd like to think of a fair old understanding of or through the years and the amount of years I've played rugby more so than Anton really about how how my mind works how my body works what I need to do in the, the week to, to feel confident going into a game that's probably as much as Anton really It's uh, Ireland captain Tyke Furlong <laughs> Sounds good doesn't it? Sounds, sounds right 60 second cap I mean He's uh, he, he so, so deserves that. I, what was refreshing for me yesterday watching that clip was was how open and honest sometimes a player's hand to the captaincy of their country and they're like, oh yeah, look, it's a great honour, blah, blah, blah. They say the old platitudes, but uh, he was literally, you could see he was buzzing and he knew everyone back in Wexford and his whole family and friends would be buzzing as well. You, you have to be, because to captain your country, and uh, look, he said himself, it's, it's a one-off game, it doesn't mean you're captain and week in, week out, but... I love that. You can see what it means. Like it's only an armband at the end of the day, but it's symbolic of so much more. You're leading your country out in a in a game, and like that's the it's the pinnacle of his career so far. And that this is a man who's been a lion's terse, You know, I think this is the this is the pinnacle uh, individually. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I, I, it's certainly like I, I, maybe we, we shouldn't fall into comparing all these things. Like he because he's he's genuinely world class and. Um, you know, he'd be in the shout for our world team of the year every year, basically since he's arrived. Mm-hmm. There's been a few minor dips in form that have been prolonged, and then he always makes a comeback from it. So the only the only slight caveat to this is that he did go off injured last week, and you would wonder if the right thing to do is to just like put him in cotton wool for six months. Mm. Um, but now I can see how he wants to play as captain this week in a game that you ordinarily would have been like. But let's you know stick Finley Beelham in there and let's stick somebody else on the bench to see yeah. how they do in the second half. Um, because it, it's not important this game and winning. I don't think anymore is important. We've done our world number one thing. I don't know if we need to like we're, let's protect being world number one for the rest of the time. No, let's just make sure that the squad is ready to go when the World Cup happens. Yeah, well, every, nothing else matters now. It's true. It's true. Uh, like everything is, everything has a purpose with Andy Farrell. Decisions have a purpose. He's clearly picking Tyke Furlong for a reason. He's like, well, he could do with this. The fact that he never thought about it, Tyke, Tyke Furlong himself, would suggest that it come fairly out of the blue for him in training and stuff. But like I, I was even telling you before we came on this morning about the, like Anthony Malloy's book, the former Donegal player in 1992. Jim McGuinness wrote the forward for it. Great excerpt online I was reading last night about what he's still the captain like he's still you will always be the captain like even anniversaries 25, 30 years later someone who is your captain always still has that that aura and that control and that um, that power which is a great thing but it look Tyke Furlong what what an honour and uh, like, dreaming of spuds and gravy as a kid he never even dreamed of this We're going to take a quick break we're back talking more rugby with former Munster and Ireland scrum half Tomas O'Leary ahead of Munster taking on a South Africa 15 at Porky Cueve tonight 
OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? You know, no Aston Villa manager has ever left Aston Villa and went on to anything. Aren't they even up to Ireland, man? But a sideways, sideways. I forgot about that. Let's, let's not have a, have a go at ourselves here. <laughs> Mick, is it? You, Aston Villa fans, have no I chance. went through all the managers and I forgot about O'Neill going to Ireland. Well, he got to the Euros, so. Yeah, it's a step up. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Right, it's 10 minutes past eight and uh, it is time for us to turn our attention to the game tonight. Um, delighted to be joined by former Munster rugby player and Pinergy ambassador Tomás O'Leary. It's a historic clash this evening because it's a pork aquive. It's Munster against the South African 15. It is an association with Pinergy, also proud sponsors of the Munster Senior Schools Cup, continuing to support the province by the hashtag powering the difference for this game, which will see professional rugby played at the famous GA venue for the first time. Uh, Tomás, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, lads. All good now. Looking forward to the game tonight. A, a sellout from like a week back. Uh, it it's almost as if the people of Cork really love their rugby. They should have every game in Cork. Uh, <laughs> now, look, Tomah Park's obviously going to be the home of Munster rugby, but you know, links like tonight um, will illustrate that you know there is a there's a hunger and there's a demand for for games in Cork, and hopefully this is the first of many. You know, we hopefully might even end up seeing quarterfinals, semi-finals of European Cup games and the big Leinster Derby games around Christmas. It'd be great to have them down in Cork. So, yeah, look, I think it's a great occasion for, for Munster Rugby, Cork GA and, and the people of Cork. So looking forward to tonight and hopefully we can get the fixture that uh, that the, you know, that the occasion warrants. It's funny how we go full circle in this whole thing because um, there was definitely a period of time where it felt like the players in Munster felt like having two separate training bases and uh, half the team based in Cork and half the team based in Limerick wasn't great. And then the high performance um, was was finished in Limerick and everybody felt like that's definitely the right thing. But in the meantime, something got lost a little bit with the connection with Cork. And it's this feels like it might be a springboard to get that whole thing back up. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, look, I suppose... Back back in the day, like I suppose the, there was pros and cons of the the dual set. Um, I suppose we made it work. You know, it almost brought a freshness to the to each training session. You know, when you meet the Limerick lads, there'd be a bit of slagging, but the competition between the Limerick and Cork camps, and uh, you know, used to meet each other to tell the stories of what was happening down in Cork and Limerick, um, and it was it was just good crack. Um, obviously, we couldn't train as much together, so. I suppose that was the major con, but um, it just added a freshness to the dynamic and, and, and it seemed to work. Look, obviously, professional rugby probably has evolved and the demands of professional rugby have evolved since then. We see that with the with the way the game has been played. So, look, I don't think you probably could have a, a dual centre anymore. Uh, but look, yeah, look, the people at Cork, I suppose we do get our games down here in Musgrave Park, but generally, um, they're, they're, they're what are, are, if we're honest, they're lesser fixtures. Um, so look, I think there is a is a real hunger for the people of Cork to be exposed to the top level of rugby and to to see an international team being welcomed to to uh, to Musgrave Park. They nearly said to Parky Cueve tonight. Um, you know, you can see the appetite for tickets. Um, you know, I'm I've been asked for tickets for the last few weeks as well, and you know, it was sold out after a couple of days. So yeah, look, I think it's important. You know, end of the day, Cork is the centre of population for Munster, and you would think that most players should be coming from. The highest centre of population. That's the case in Leinster. Most of the players come from Dublin. Not all the players, obviously. So I think yeah, Cork needs definitely needs to be uh, given more fixtures, and hopefully this is a nod from Munster Rugby uh, that there is going to be more fixtures down here in Parky Cueve. It's ne- it's nearly highlighted that even more, Tomas. Like this this fixture, the fact that there is so much GA talent as well as rugby talent down in Cork, and and you are one of those people with the All Ireland minor hurling title as well. And for for people like yourself and Darren Sweetnam. You probably had that crossroads when you when you were younger. You've got two red jerseys, both steeped in tradition, and you've got to make that choice. Um, and I guess the lure of professionalism sends a lot of people towards rugby. But games like tonight, you know, a massive monster game in, in Parky Cueve kind of highlights that for a lot of young players, yourself included, there was a decision to make. Yeah, look, they're exactly that. And look, I suppose, as you said, I grew up in a, in a, hurling, a hurling household and the, the only jersey I wanted to wear for a majority of my my, my youth was the blood and bandage of Cork. Uh, I wanted to emulate my father and I suppose emulate great players that have gone on to win All-Irelands in the past. Um, 
you know, and I suppose the old the old saying now, if, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So like I'm bringing my my seven year old to the match tonight, and you know I think that might, you know, those experiences they leave they leave an indelible impact on young kids. So if he's at a packed out Parky Queef seeing monster players play against the likes of South Africa, um, that leaves an imprint on his mind, and you know that can focus him. So you know he will be exposed to other sports, he will be exposed to GA and soccer and a few more, and it's those experiences that will guide him and will I suppose make him, uh, you know, select a sport down the line. I think players and kids play as many sports um, till as late as they can and obviously if they're good enough they'll be fortunate enough to have a I suppose have a decision to make and I was lucky that I had gone on to see Munster play in European quarterfinals play in European semi-finals you know I was looking up to the likes of Ron O'Gara Paul O'Connell all these guys and I wanted to be part of that yes I want to be a professional rugby player but I wanted to be part of that team I want to be play with those guys and, and I suppose stand for what they stood for so it's not just the, the opportunity to be a pro professional athlete, it's the opportunity to experience occasions like that and play on occasions like that. So that's why I think it's very, very important for young Cork kids and, and, and Cork families to be exposed to high-level rugby and top-level rugby. I was talking a little bit about this and it was kind of more instinctive than anything based on evidence yesterday that uh, it feels like Munster, it's far more acceptable for you to be a fan of everything um, whereas like uh, sports fandom in Leinster is a bit more segmented there are Dublin Gaelic football fans and there are Leinster fans and there's some crossover but there's not as significant a crossover I would argue as there is between Cork Hurling fans and Munster Rugby fans it just seems as if it's totally accepted you're a Cork Hurling fan you're also a Munster Rugby fan and there's no real division maybe around the fringes there's some areas of division is that true? am I making that up? Uh, well certainly uh, true in, in the most part Look, like you said there is there is a, a certain uh, element that just focus on one one sport, um, but yeah, look, I suppose, and a lot of people will be members of GA clubs and rugby clubs. Um, so look, I think yeah, look, as you said, it's not just GA, it's not just soccer, it's not just um, you know the traditional rugby sports down here. You know, you got you got a lot of different athletes who come from here. Obviously, Sonia Sullivan, Rob Heffernan. See, the soccer influence is very big, and um, in terms of Roy Keane, so the roars down in West Cork, so. It's a very broad, um, I suppose, sporting interest, and that's something we're, I suppose, proud of down here. And I think, it, like I said, I think specialisation in sport from an early age, and look, there's been a lot of different, uh, I suppose, studies done in that. But I think the more sports you can play, the broader, I suppose, influence you can have, the more skills you learn. And that's just not, not just ter- that's not just in terms of the actual skills themselves, it's in terms of strategy, and it's in terms of spatial awareness. So I think all those skills develop a kid and socially as well um, they're not so focused on one sport not so concentrated on one sport and there's probably less pressure so look I think certainly Cork people support multiple sports uh, but Munster Rugby definitely is up there and Munster Rugby is a special place in, in I suppose most people uh, Cork people and that's why it's important that you know Cork people don't have to always travel to Limerick don't have yeah. to always go abroad to see them so you know they can they can finish work go for a pint and, and stroll down to Parky Cueve I think the more things we can provide for, for Cork people, the better, yeah. The reason I was talking about it really was because I, I believe very strongly that Cork GA has a very progressive CEO who's doing really great work and has managed to transform the club championship and get it into, uh, you know, with the support of many people, it has to be said, but get it into a situation where you're starting to see the underage players come through to senior club ranks. And it'll be very interesting to see over the next couple of years how the senior teams do. But as part of that they've decided to go, we're actually brave enough and willing to invite rugby into Porky Cueve in a way that I think they're going to benefit from in the long run, not just from the gate receipts from tonight or whatever the financial arrangements are, that actually you can mobilise a fan base by getting people to go to things and actually not being threatened by the other sports. Yeah, look, I agree. And I think it's uh, it's indicative of how society has moved on. Um, a majority of the GA people who may have no influence or, or no relation to rugby would be supportive of this fixture. Um, so again, it's a it's a wider, uh, I suppose, societal uh, reflection as well. Um, and I, I agree with you. Look, you look, even look at Limerick GA and the impact they've had, and maybe that has had a slight negative impact on on rugby in Limerick. And, and, and look, I suppose there is competition when it comes to lads at 17, 18 years of age and the top talent. You look at that, um, you know, with uh, Ben O'Connor here down in Cork in the sixth year prez, he just won a county final playing with the Bars, senior hurling, lost the county final to Nemo, playing with the Bars. He was with Prez last year, got to the senior cup final. I know he's been looked at for potentially a Munster Academy. So 
those guys, there's also going to be competition for that. But at the end of the day, it's going to be an individual decision. And we know that the likes of Ben O'Connor, the likes of Darren Sweetenham, who you already uh, spoke about earlier, you know, he played in the semi final with Cork. Um, end of the day, it's going to be a personal decision. They'd love to play with both, but that's not feasible. So um, I don't think the GA or, or Munster Rugby can really influence that decision. We just have to provide those kids with the best possible experiences growing up. Um, and I agree, you know, Cork GA is very progressive. And now it's up to Munster Rugby, which um, tonight's fixture is an illustration that they're progressive and they, they're keen to have top-level rugby played in Cork. You touched, Tomas, on, on, on the importance of, of young kids growing up playing playing a multitude of different sports. And like you mentioned, um, spatial awareness is something there. And I know even from, you know playing hurling back in your, your day, probably playing hurling, it was 15 on 15. It, the game has changed probably slightly. Um, and even things like hand-eye coordination. Do you think like your background in hurling almost gave you an advantage in rugby in terms of, do you, know, do you think it improved your, your ability to, to get through and reach the level of rugby that, that you did? Yeah, I don't know, really. Um, it certainly do, didn't do me any harm. Uh, and I do think those hand-eye coordination skills are you know, really, really important. So yeah, look, you can't get much much, uh, much more of a, a suitable sport for hand-eye coordination than, than hurling. Um, uh, look, I, I do think it gave me an appreciation of, I suppose, uh, you know, of, of space, like you said, look, it was more man on man, 15 on 15, and you might get the odd fella coming in here next to you, you know, for a breaking ball. But I think the current game um, has gone so tactical. Um, it's almost cat like rugby. I was speaking to a few, a few rugby coaches during the week, and like rugby is so nuanced, um, so tactical now um, that it's a, it's a really, really enjoyable game to coach. And Gaelic football is getting so possession orientated. Even now, hurling, you see the Limerick team and you see other teams, you know, it's all about possession and how to create space for inside forwards and, and the movement off the ball and, and the movement to get on the ball and shorter passes. So that's becoming more more nuanced as well. So coaching and hurling, coaching and football is becoming, I suppose, uh, it's catching up with rugby, becoming as, as strategic. Obviously, you won't have the set piece. Well, if you, if you don't consider puck out set piece, um, so it's it's certainly there is elements that are are, are becoming very, uh, I, I suppose, uh, very similar. Um, but the hand-eye coordination probably is probably the biggest piece. Look, end of the day, if you can if you can catch a slur from 70, 80 yards, control it on a hurley and stick it over the bar, that's certainly going to benefit your ability to to catch a rugby ball or to pass a rugby ball. I think so. Yeah, I definitely think that as many kids should be should be playing as many sports as possible. Obviously, when these fixtures happen, the Ireland players are away and uh, they're not considered for selection. So, you know, you would kind of think, oh, it's not necessarily Munster's strongest team. But then you see the team named and it is still a really strong, exciting team with that sprinkling of incredible youth and some experience in it as well. So what, what level of performance do you expect from, like, just to go back to Roundtree has said he's not going to let the players out onto the pitch for the first time. Obviously, the kickers will be there, but like not everybody's going to go out and see the crowd until they actually go out. So it's going to be like the place is going to be on fire. Uh, what, do, what level of performance should we expect from Munster tonight? I don't know. Um, I suppose Munster has struggled, if we're honest, at the start of the season. Um, and I think this is an opportunity almost a free shot. Um, pressure is off these guys. You know, there's no league points. There's no, I suppose, the negative discourse that is around Munster rugby. And, you know, will they qualify for the Champions Cup? Um, the new coaching ticket is taking time to, to, to bet in their ideas. Um, you know, this is a separate fixture. This is a standalone fixture. Uh, Munster have a chance to to knock uh, an international 15 off their perch, the world champions. I know it's not their first side, but it's a really, really strong uh, South Africa select. So um, I suppose this this is just giving this Munster team basically a free shot. And the motivation, hopefully, like you said, the atmosphere created by the Munster fans, that's going to give give this give this Munster team an impetus, a motivation, a bounce that hopefully will bring an energy. And I think even though rugby, as I said, has become a lot more strategic and tactical, um, you know, when you have that physical motivation, when you have that, um, I suppose, that physical prowess or, or, you know, that extra 10, 15 percent that an atmosphere like tonight can provide, you know, I think that is powerful. Uh, and we all know that Munster will need to be physical tonight to stand up to how South Africa are going to play the game. So if Munster can can have that kind of, uh, I suppose, that it's, it's hard to gauge, but, you know, when a team is at it physically uh, and I think everything else will flow after that. So. Hopefully, you know, it'll be interesting to see the likes of Frisch coming in in the centre. Uh, and, you know, Paddy Patterson, looking forward to seeing him at nine. You know, can he manage uh, a monster team around the park? Can he dictate the tempo? 
um, in a night like tonight, it looks like it might be be uh, be wet and, and and windy down here. You know, playing at half seven at night, ball's going to be dewy uh, anyway. So you're not going to be able to play a lot of rugby early days against this hard press South Africa defence. So look, it's going to be very very interesting as to how Munster approach the game. But I definitely think occasions like this, um, you know, they're standalone fixtures and players are not going to be thinking about the league. Players are not going to think about Irish rugby. It's trying to create history for this monster group and hopefully that can create a powerful um, bond within the team and give them a real jump tonight. Talk to us about the nines, will you? What, what have you seen about uh, Patterson that you liked and what are the bits that he needs to work on? Um, well, I suppose I haven't seen a whole pile really thus far this season. I like his tempo. Um, but, you know, he can only have tempo if he gets front foot ball. If Munster, I suppose, don't get go forward ball. So, um, you know, if, if the South African defence is on top, all of a sudden his ability to have that high tempo, uh, quick rook ball is gone. And then they're going to have to go to the air. And we all know that South Africa like 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 that. So um, if he gets quick tempo ball, um, if Munster can get go forward ball, again, that's down to dynamic ball carries, maybe carrying a soft shoulders um, in the rook. The, the, you know the, the lads in the rock, you know, basically clearing the threat before the the opportunity is, is gone for them to get on the ball. Then I think he moves the ball really nicely and he looks good. Um, the question for me is, you know, if that ball becomes slow ball, you know, has he got the ability um, to control it like um, a Connor Murray? You know, good box kicks, giving our wingers an opportunity to compete. Because I know um, South Africa having worked under Erasmus and Nienenbar. They place a big emphasis on that kick contest, on their wingers winning that, and all, on the rest of the players then winning the scrap. So, I think that you know, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have a real flow, uh, free flowing game tonight. Um, and I think it's going to come down to, I suppose, the physical confrontation. And I think it's going to come down to ball in the air and, and, and who's going to win that kicking contest. So, that's the question mark we have over Patterson. And look, it's, we're going to get a lot of answers tonight. Yeah, big opportunity for him. What what's the the pecking order at the moment? Um, how how close is Craig Casey to being the monster number one? And uh, I mean, maybe he's going to get an opportunity now that uh, Conor Murray got injured last week. Um, it was kind of interesting to see Conor Murray getting the start against South Africa, and very unfortunate in that precise moment that he makes the break that we've been dying for him to do. He actually picks up an injury. So, what, what how close is that battle at the moment? Very close. Um... You get a sense that Munster want to really play at real high tempo, um, and you know I suppose Casey's more of the ilk of Gibson Park than than Connor is, and I think uh, you know basically I think international rugby is is a diff- is a different is a different game altogether. You can see the impact that Connor had with his defensive abilities, his physical his physical uh, his physical nature um, in the first half. You know he he made a lot a lot of tackles. And like I said, then he got got his line break unfortunately before his injury. Um, so when Connor plays like that, um, definitely he he'll he'll be second choice and certainly second choice for for Ireland. The, the, the thing that this Munster team is trying to trying to create is is a way of playing and a, I suppose a new approach to the game. And I think Casey seems to suit that. Um, and Munster just haven't quite clicked into gear yet. Um, I suppose they're getting used to new new strategy, a new a new uh, a new way of playing the game. But I, I do think they seem to be trying to push. Casey to be to be that fulcrum to be that key key player, and then Connor to be coming on. So my sense is with that Casey is is going to be the first choice, and and, and Murr will be the, the the closer, the fellow to come on and finish games or add his experience. You know, maybe when they were playing the likes of uh, La Rochelle or they were playing the likes of the Saracens in the European quarter final, then there's a conversation: Do you start Murray? Do you, you utilize his physical prowess? Do you utilize his experience? So I think it's very much going to be a case of you know, give Casey as much experience as possible, you know, get him as the fulcrum of this team. But when the needs uh, dictate, you bring in Murray and he starts He starts the odd game. That uh, that requires a more physical abrasive and experience from half. It obviously hasn't been uh, the season that Munster would have wanted so far, Tomas, but like you look at some of the recent URC games and you're, you're looking at the bench and you're seeing a, a lot of lads under the age of 23. Um, like it's a bit of a rebuild project, I guess, for, for Graham Rountree. Like does he have regardless of results at the minute and they haven't been good he has a bit of credit credit in the bank surely and, and, and you know if you do label it as a rebuild project he will have time to create what he wants yeah look it's I think so I think um, from chatting to the players they're very excited about uh, this current uh, management group um, and look while um, what they're working on on the, on the training paddock hasn't really translated 
in terms of performance onto the onto the pitch. Um, you know, I know there's there's certainly uh, confidence within the playing group that they're going to get there. Um, like you said, look, the the players that that are coming, uh, getting opportunity to be exposed at at the top level, uh, and and the age profile of that is exciting for for Munster rugby, and I think like that. So the the emergence of of some young talent, and I say the fixture like tonight, I think there almost is a bit of an apathy developing, you know, uh, regarding Munster rugby, um, you know, from from media, from some ex players, from supporters, um, or certainly there's perception that it is. Um, fixtures like tonight maybe can give the opportunity for, you know, the bond between supporters and players, something that Munster was always really, really, um, I suppose, famous for. If you could have a fixture tonight and a performance tonight from the players, then you think you can get that 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 bond will be re-strengthened, that bond will start to re-emerge, um, you know, that symbolic kind of relationship between the players and the and the fans, you know, one needs the one needs the other uh, in order for them both to perform at the highest level. I think it, tonight is a big opportunity for the players to give a performance for the supporters, then to get on, uh, you know, really sub- start supporting like Munster supporters can. So, and then again, when Munster supporters see younger players from Cork, Limerick, Waterford, West Cork, all these different places coming on, being given a chance, and they see honest performances. Then that relationship will start to to re strengthen. I think that's key for this monster, monster team, and key for monster in general is that really that relationship between monster fans and supporters remains strong. And and I suppose it goes back to the goes back to the level that it used to be at. We spoke uh, yesterday, Tomas, to uh, to Keith Ward about um, Razi Erasmus and his uh, his little Twitter videos after the the win over South Africa. And I know he's someone who has. Uh, a lot of fans down in Munster, and a lot of people uh, think great things of him. Uh, like, what do you make of of these little bits on social media that pop up every now and again? Like, a lot of people describe it as sour grapes, um, but I guess it's just peak razzy. Yeah, look, I, I personally don't like it anyway, but um, I think it's kind of petulant. Um, you know, every coach could pick out numerous instances in every game, um, and look, I think it just sets a bad example. Like if. You know, I'm, I'm coaching young kids and I'm coaching schoolboys, and if that's the kind of carry on that you know, and obviously he's the head head man in South Africa, you know, he you know he's got a lot of young coaches looking up to him. He's got a lot of young kids looking up to him. I don't think in this day and age, you know, the pressure on referees. You know, we see the pressure on GA referees, soccer referees. You know, how they actually are physically threatened as well. And now, when you you focus in on their mistakes, I think it's going to be harder and harder to get referees, particularly at that top level. When their mistakes are going to be highlighted like that, it also sets a bad precedent to your team. Um, you know what I mean? You can analyze all that um, internally as a team, and you know, obviously there is external influence, and the referee does have it. But yeah, look, I don't like that side of it anyway. Certainly not. Look, I think he is obviously a very, very good um, coach or director of rugby. He did a brilliant job in, in in Munster. Really brought up the levels in terms of performance. Um, he obviously did the same in South Africa, going on to win a World Cup. So. You know he he knows how to how to get a group tick and he knows how to how to lead a group. But I think he, he I think they lets himself down with with that kind of carry on. There's a sense that um, Nathan had a theory that it was a bit like Jose Mourinho comes in has an immediate impact, but that eventually on the players the same message and the same sense of like okay it's this is how it's going to be and I'm going to be at the centre of absolutely everything and I'm going to take all the the trouble but I'm also going to get a lot of the credit if it's there that there's a there's a bang of that off off the the razzy way of doing things incredible short term impact but not really that sustainable yeah look I don't know um, I suppose he wasn't in Munster long enough for for us to to to, to see whether it would have been sustainable or um you know, obviously in South Africa, you know, he he had that initial bounce, definitely winning a World Cup. So now the question is, you know, we're going to see over the next even even you know this weekend they're going to be playing against France. So potentially they'll have two two losses on the bounce. What happens then? Um, like you said, going into the World Cup next year, you know teams are getting a lot more competitive. Like I already mentioned, France, Ireland are now number one in the world. New Zealand seem to be getting their mojo back together. Australia are capable of, of you know, good performance or brilliant performance. Argentina as well, so I think it's a lot, lot more competitive landscape internationally. So it'll be very, very interesting um, to see if they can maintain those standards. And yeah, look, there. If you look from the outside, certainly it might seem like that. That you know he likes to be uh, ahead in front of everything, and even you know that's the case. You know Jack Nienbauer is the the head coach. Yeah, most of the 
I suppose the conversation and is about Erasmus all the time. So uh, potentially you might be right in your assertion there. Right, good stuff, Tomas. Uh, what's going to happen tonight? Give me a, give me a prediction. Uh, hard to know. Probably South Africa, but I'm going to have to have to say Munster. To, to these fixtures always seem to, to bring performance, and, and hopefully this is the performance that Munster need to kick on and, and get their season back and back and going. Yeah, it's a real opportunity for them. Great to have you with us, Tomas. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, lads. That's uh, Tomas O'Leary there, uh, Pinergy ambassador, um, head of the game tonight. Now, OTBAM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mow. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Uh, Bobby Dwyer says, with Hugo Lloris coming to the end at Spurs, I'd take Kelleher at Spurs in a heartbeat to replace him and be the number one for the next 10 years. I couldn't see Liverpool selling to us, though. Um, I think they're going to you're starting to see clubs sell to other clubs because yeah. nobody else will buy and the money is too good to turn down 100% rivals um, you'd imagine so it kind of struck me as well uh, chatting to Ben Jacobs earlier but like Chelsea drawing Dortmund in the Champions League and you've got all these Jude Bellingham links to Chelsea and you know does a team meeting another team in the Champions League open up a negotiation a conversation when they when they come over for the away leg I don't know but it seems on the back pages that Haaland is very much or uh, Bellingham is very much city city linked at the minute but it's an interesting one like every, everybody's in the Bellingham stakes this is um, yeah the transfer industrial complex is now has moved on from Erling Haaland and Mbappe last year to Jude Bellingham and Declan Rice for the next nine months so Tune in, tune out, or wait until they actually sign for somebody. I say that and we'll do like 15 pieces on uh, where Jude Bellingham would fit in at uh, Manchester United slash Liverpool slash Manchester City slash Manchester United slash Chelsea. So uh, that's the game. Uh, Alisson's 30. He could be gone in four or five years, says Fergus Kyo. Does Kelleher want to bide his time, develop and play for one of the top teams in Europe? I go to Fulham or West Ham and stagnate. Four or five years is a long time, but it might just be about the right time, is it? But how do you how is going to a Fulham or West Ham stagnating? Is that like, you're still a, you're a Premier League starting goalkeeper. Like uh, you never play in the biggest games. Yeah, but so how how long? Like maybe you go on loan for for a year or two, see what happens. Come back to Liverpool when Allison's uh, career is over. Bob yeah. Bob's onto something there. Carrier's twenty three. He'll be twenty four this month. Twenty four this month. Yeah. So in five years time he'll be twenty nine, which is not late. You know, oh. you can still. But uh, you'd want you'd want to be getting first team football at twenty six, twenty seven. That's what I say. Hundred percent. You need it. Like, uh, but that gives me three years to. But what's ro- I just don't see what's wrong with playing for a Fulham or West Ham and making a career out of it. You're not playing in the Champions League games, of course. Well, because he might be a Champions League goalkeeper. He could, yeah. be, he could be Thibaut Courtois. He could be. He could be. Uh, but I just uh, you can't hold on for an indefinite period. Alisson has... In fairness, Alisson. Courtois was getting his moves around the world to play the first-team football. But yeah. Okay, okay. Try and get first-team football at a Champions League. It wasn't it, Somebody said he was offered to pay his bay at one stage. Right. That was that was knocking around in the ether. Um, you know... Yeah, a little move abroad mightn't be the worst thing. Well, a Spanish Champions League team, a Dutch Champions League team is a little different, I'm not sure. Could you go to Sporting? Nice nice lifestyle in Lisbon. Yeah, yeah 100%. Um, or Benfica, they'd, they'd have a good transfer policy. Or go on loan for a season to a Champions League team and see what happens. Life experience, yeah. Worst case scenario, you come back after a year and you've, you've played a bit of Champions League football. Nothing wrong with it. He has options, Cuevin Kelleher. He does. That's a good, a good thing. He does. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, still to come, Craig Hope on the latest at Newcastle. Cork Camogie legend Gem O'Connor on her new autobiography. But now at 8.38, it's time for the sports pages. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean a spoofer? He's a bullshit. Ah, no, Emma, come on, don't, don't be... No, I'm not... Yes. No. Take a Carabao Queeve. Oh, no. Was it? Take a bow, take a carabao. Oh, uh, okay, okay. But carabao is a sports drink, right? Uh, it is. So, like, it doesn't work. I'm sorry, lads. Nah. It just it doesn't work. Uh, United are intent on winning, and they've got the 10 in red because obviously it's Eric Ten Hag. So, the lads, uh, the, they're phoning it in on the back page this morning because um, Manchester United are intent on becoming the best team in the world in the next two years so it's two years away Shane you just have, to, just have two years patience yeah. don't worry about the results at the moment just give me two years yeah. at this point now and in six months time I'll come back to you I'm just two years away always two years away I have a five year plan Southgate ready to bring Rashford back into the England fold this is the story that Steinberg and Heitner have in the back of the Guardian they also have it in Telegraph uh, three lines to win trophy says forecast model with fine records so the bookmakers and the money that's what um, it's like the octopus predicting the winners I was going to ask was it what, what animal it was 
Calvin Phillips is back playing football. That's the back of the Telegraph. Um, da -da -da. Uh, Walker fit for the World Cup, says the London Times. Um, golf gift for Bales Wales. What are they? What are they doing? They're gonna. They're they're bringing a simulator so that Gareth Bale and his mates, who also like golf, not just Gareth, can play golf. Yeah. In the uh, no Captain time. Furlong only dreamed of spuds and gravy. That's Ty Furlong uh, answering Ashley O'Reilly's question at the press conference yesterday about what he did dream of as a kid: spuds and gravy and the the Sunday roast. Farrell ready to mix and match for the Fiji test. So. Thornley's uh, possible lineup versus Fiji is Larry at fullback, Balakoon, Henshaw back in the team, McCluskey back in the team, Stockdale, Carberry, Gibson Park. It's not a bad team. No, no, it's not bad at all. If this is if this is it, it's like we're gonna we're taking Fiji seriously. And then it's uh, Healy, Herring, Furlong at captain, Treadwell and Byrne in the second row. Right, I suppose Tagbert hasn't played that much. Doris at six, Timoney at seven, Conan at eight. That's a team that could do damage against Fiji. This is not our Ireland A. This is not like giving lads caps for no reason. No, this is the type of team that, that could really, really put on a show. And I know the Fiji tickets are easier to get their hands on than the uh, South Africa or Australia tickets, but if a team like that goes out... Gibson Park and Carberry at 9 and 10. That's what we want to see, right? Yeah, you'll take that. Jesus. Because Scotland, uh, Scotland didn't even play that well against Fiji last weekend and, and won handsomely enough. Oh, I thought they were crap in the first half, and it was touch and go. Yeah, it, like, but what was it, twenty at twelve or something in the end? Like yeah. it was, a, it was a couple of scores, couple of scores win. But Ireland could really do some damage against Fiji on Saturday. Uh, that's, uh, that's I, I, I do believe that um, people are thinking you're getting ahead of yourself there, Shane. But, Possibly. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You said that, not me. Colin, Lanny, good morning to you. How are you? How are you, lads? How's it going? What's the crack? Not much now. It's uh, busy enough morning. Nathan Jones appointed. Uh, one of the pages or the back pages is Jim McGuinness linked to the Finn Harps right. manager's job. Here we go. Can we make that happen, please? Jim back that'd in. That would be fantastic. I mean, it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. That would be fantastic. Does he need to take one of these senior jobs sooner rather than later? Or is he... Maybe he's just going to be a backroom kind of youth development. Like, maybe that's the long-term future. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I get a sense from him that uh, the stuff that he has mentioned in the media that he does want to crack at a job. But he's been, he said that he wants to wait for the right opportunity. Um it's a county. It's a club in his home county. Uh, they're going to be in the first division next season. So, whether they have the resources to invest the way that he might want to, I'm not so sure. But it'd be great if they could come to some sort of agreement. It would be fantastic for the league when you consider uh, the profile that Damien Duff has created yeah. with Shelburne. Uh, McGuinness was, I mean, he's one of the most fascinating figures in Irish sport. Is it high profile enough for him? I mean, like geographically speaking, it could be a good option for him, but. You know, as you say, first division, like... Is he working with the Derry under-20s? Is that... He had the, been, yeah. He's involved in Derry's underage setup, yeah. But as you say, Jerry, I mean, there probably does come a time where you have to take the plunge and take on a job. Uh, he has been... He has said that he's obviously keen to get involved in soccer. I'm sure he's had any amount of offers in terms of football teams and Gaelic games. Well, he spent time in China and he spent time in Carolina. Like, you know, he's he's been willing to go and cut his teeth and learn. So... At some point, you'd, you'd hope he'll take the plunge, just even from a, an interest perspective. But certainly, it would be box office. Oh, it'd be class. Like, we, already, we were already talking about the League of Ireland um, more positively and, and, and more because of the likes of Damien Duff, as you said. Like, you need high-profile managers because they're characters, and, and like it or not, we'll watch, we'll watch press conferences and games because Damien Duff is involved. Uh, so, yeah, the more big names that can come into the League of Ireland, managerial-wise, the better, I think. But, yeah, I'd be interested to see if he takes it. Like it, it, it all depends what he wants because if he wants a League of Ireland job that's close to home this is going to be the one he's going to take but there's a, there's good money in the media game and he's uh, he's making a, a serious career out of that if he wants to stick with that he can uh, the other thing is that like the Derry job at some point will become available again because it's football and they always become and there's definitely going to be significant amounts of investment and while the, the roads aren't great it's not that far yeah yeah maybe Derry City is the one yeah it's like a Rovers call yeah um, but you would think somewhere in the northwest would would suit him from a geographical point of view. But um, yeah, that going would be fascinating. Or maybe he gets a job in the Irish League, where it's it's off Broadway in many respects from like uh, you know Irish media coverage. It gets yeah. none. Like let's face it, 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 no no one ever reports on the results of the Irish League. Mm. So mm. nobody could tell you. Could you could you name any of the Glentoran or Linfield players? See, it's it's BBC Sport and I that that cover, we, we don't really cover it down here. So maybe that is the the way Ballet to get a <laughs> the Stalray now, Lemavari. Yeah, I think he would want limelight, wouldn't he? Because 
he could attract uh, I think the crowds would go to matches just to watch a Jim McGuinness team in the League of Ireland 100% and maybe people in Donegal from a GA background would they be intrigued their football. Yeah. to go to uh, some soccer matches because Jim McGuinness is involved and it's a fantastic place and to get go the Celtic park. connection you know like yeah. could, you, could you reanimate that and get some young Celtic players on loan yeah. start playing a bit of Ange ball <laughs> there you go see win it's the first coming division, together win the first division with 10 games to spare just sheer dominance I'd love to see it mm. Um, but let's uh, keep an eye on that. And more reports as well. We mentioned this yesterday morning that pa- Pat Gilroy. Gilroy? Pat Gilroy. Let's go Gilroy. Yeah. <laughs> He's been linked again with the Dublin setup, so there, it appears that that could well happen, uh, which is going to be very interesting. Division yeah. 2 dubs, of course, playing Kildare in the first game in Croker. In Croker. I, didn't, I, I saw some people saying, oh, they'll go back to Parnell Park now. And they're in the division. Like, Why would they do that? That's nonsense. Yeah. It makes no sense. Yeah. I'd love to see it. But well, I mean, they'll, they'll get a much bigger crowd for the Kildare game than they would have got for like many of the first division teams yeah there's no way the dubs don't get out of division 2 isn't there there's no possible way um, like, that's a good, you look at the you'd, teams you'd be surprised like, but like at the same time I don't think they're going to care mm, no the only thing they care about is stopping knocking Kerry off their effing perch yeah. right yeah. so like if they discover four players in division 2 and win f- three games but don't go up they don't care yeah, and they have some trips. I think they have a trip to Derry and they have a trip to Cork. They have to do yeah, a lot of travel. They've got Navin as well. Yeah. Navin against Conor Meade. That'll be so. good. Yeah. yeah, that's that's, that's a great division. Yeah. It's a dog now, you'd expect them to win all those games, irrespective of having yeah. to travel to Cork. or. Um, yeah. They didn't win in Newbridge last year, but, you know, obviously they... Got didn't win in Clonus either, Jeff. but... Um, yeah. It's not an easy division too. I like I, w- I wouldn't like Monaghan to go down there because it's just a well, you actually shark mentioned pit. Derry there. I forgot Derry were down there. Uh, yeah, they didn't get out last year. So like I mean they'll be definitely intent on getting some promo- getting uh, some momentum and earning promotion from there because they missed out narrowly last year, didn't they? Yeah. And uh, Kildare, you would expect Meath would have a bit of bit of a kick in them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat Kilroy coming into that Dublin backroom team just adds another bit of intrigue, I think. Because I never would have seen him as a, as a backroom team man. But is it confirmed? Yeah, not confirmed. It's not confirmed, fully, but, but he's still being linked. Uh, it's on the back of the Independent this morning. He's in the mirror yesterday. So links are growing legs. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I did a bit of digging. Have heard that uh, it it wasn't one hundred percent confirmed yet, but that it's been rumoured for a while. And uh, I think it's a really good move by Desi. It's a real clear sign that uh, he's not challenged by other very strong people. That actually, you know, not in a bad way. That he'll be challenged in a good way by other very strong people. But that his ego isn't so big that he's like, oh, I can't have anybody of Pacquiao's stature. And it's like, yeah, you come in, you help us. Yeah. You know, I think that's a really positive sign. It's kind of a, you know, in terms of if you were to talk about dream teams, like we've talked about the Mayo dream team, huh. and we've talked about the Claire dream team, uh, having Pat Gilroy back in, who like is the, the godfather of the six in a row team, you know, like yeah. they, it was his team and his setup that stopped the famine, like uh, reorganized and ended the chaos years. And handed that over to Jim Gavin who obviously perfected it it's a show of faith in Desi Farrell because uh, by all accounts at the end of last year I thought he was gone I think a lot of people thought well that's that's the end he was going to walk away maybe on his own terms but uh, decided to stay put and having someone like Gilroy come in that's a complete rubber stamp of appro- approval from the Dublin board going here you go here's a here's a top man in your backroom team that you know very well it's funny in the J the trends that emerge isn't it like another manager joining a backroom team as a backroom team person yeah 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 like you had Paddy Talley and Kerry you had Aidan O'Rourke has gone in with Paddy Carr and Tony Gall the Mayo management team is obviously Rockford stacked with former well. managers yeah yeah do you know I do think that part of this is what happened with Stuart Lancaster who was like uh, I was head coach but I was also reporting to the board and I was making sure that the sponsors yeah. were happy and I had to set up uh, mm-hmm. Team England and I had to do all these other things and then at the same time the bid on the pitch was, was, was and then he comes over and it's like absolute genius you know um, well you're away from the headlines it's like Stephen Rochford did it in Donegal and he's now doing it in Mayo where Kevin McStay will do all the media work and the, the face ahead of the in front of the scenes like even Malachy O'Rourke you look at him taking charge of Glenn and Derry and, and he could have taken the Donegal job didn't he, why would you want the headlines because like, you're covering you're, you're manager of a club team and you have none of that to, de- to deal with yeah now I'm not, I'm not saying that Gillow's gone in as a coach in the same way that Lancaster did but it, like I can see him working with players on all sorts of different things like you know, listen to Paul Flynn talking about the impact that Pat Gilroy had on him it wasn't him as a footballer it was him as a man becoming somebody who was fulfilling his potential and starting to think about like the the broad hinterland of your life 
And uh, if you can do that for some of the young Dublin footballers coming through and just inject that level of commitment and, um, you know, effort that they need, like then that's something that Desi Farrell doesn't need to worry about. He can actually spend yeah. his time working on something else too. So uh, not not, uh, not great for the other counties. No. And he strikes me, Pat, as someone who's, who's Dublin loyal. Like he, he, I'm sure, had plenty of offers uh, to, to manage outside of Dublin and, and, and cut his teeth with other people as well. Not cut his teeth, but get involved and, and find a new experience. But clearly is a dub, uh, true and true, and doesn't want to, to help any other county, which is fair enough. So we'll see if that's confirmed sooner rather than later. Anything else, Carl? Well, there's uh, some cricket action this morning. The second of the semi-finals at the T20 World Cup is underway. England are playing India, and uh, let's just get you a latest score on that one. India uh, batting first. England won the toss and chose to bowl. India currently 75 for the loss of three wickets. That's after 11 overs. Uh, so the winner will face Pakistan in that final. Uh, Jordan Brown in action at the UK Championship later. He's uh, one match away from a place in the tournament proper. He plays Zach Shorty in the final round of qualifiers later today. The first is six frames in that match. Uh, will earn a place in the first round. The Republic of Ireland uh, football squad for this month's international friendlies will be named today. Andy Farrell names his rugby team to play Fiji later on today as well. And of course, Munster against South Africa A on tonight at Porky Cueve from half past seven. And uh, some golfers in action. Leona Maguire returns to action at the Pelican Women's Championship on the LPGA Tour. Stephanie Meadow also in the field there. All right, Carl, good stuff. It's 8.51, that's Carl Malani there. If you want to get in touch, 087 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. A reminder, OTB AM is brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent Mo. You can sign up or donate now at <coughs> pardon me, movember.com. Now, we want to turn our attention to uh, one of the stories of the football season so far, um, on and off the field, obviously. It's uh, Newcastle, and I'm delighted to say Craig Hope is back with us. Craig, good morning to you. How are you getting on? Morning, guys. Very good. Very good. We were doing a bit about uh, Chelsea earlier on, and you know the situation they find themselves in, and the, the little blip that uh, Potter's going through at the moment. And then was looking forward to the next fixture, and of course, well, lo and behold, it's uh, St James's Park. Which in previous seasons maybe Chelsea would have chalked down as an automatic three points, but not anymore. Suddenly, the trip to St James's Park is pretty grim for everybody else. Yeah, well, for a lot of years, Newcastle were the Samaritans of Premier League football, you know, in need of a win, in need of a pick-me-up, you know, Dilo 191 for, for Tyneside, and uh, the teams would invariably come here, and Newcastle had this incredible run of uh, of, of breaking teams, uh, losing sequences uh, in, in the wrong way, of course. Not anymore, you know, 2022, Newcastle have only lost once at St James's Park, and that was to Liverpool. They've only lost once this season, uh, in all competitions and that again was to Liverpool and only in the 98th minute so it is an entirely different prospect up here now and, and Chelsea really couldn't probably wish to be coming to a worse place especially given you know it is the it, it's the last game before they send off Newcastle into the World Cup break uh, it's a tea time kickoff that gives the Geordies an extra two and a half hours to get some ale inside them inside the town St James's will be absolutely bouncing there always is that extra little bit of uh a little bit of zip and a bit of zest under the under the lights as well. And, you know, for once, as, as, as a journalist covering the, the North East patch up here, you're going into home games fully expecting Newcastle United to win. And I'll be very surprised if, they, if it didn't beat Chelsea again on Saturday night. What is what is it that makes <clears throat> Eddie Howe a good manager? What are, what are the characteristics that you've seen so far, apart from like being good in the transfer market? And, and you know, that's obviously a, a committee decision, or not, not just not just him. Obviously, he's got a, a voice in it. But like the the bits that have made Almiron good at mm. the level that he's playing at, like what what is Howe good at? If I was going to list his qualities, I would say he, he is honest, he's intelligent, and he's extremely hardworking. Now, if you put those three things together, I think the modern player and, and supporter also will buy into you. And Eddie has got an awful lot of goodwill up here, be that from within the dressing room or be that on the terraces. Uh, he just, from the minute he walked in, he was believable. And I, I sit here as a journalist, how many times have I been on your show? Whenever I come on here, it's invariably to, to talk about a manager who have fallen out with or a manager that, that I don't necessarily rate. I can honestly say this guy is the real deal. He absolutely is top draw. When he came into the club, there was people probably from beyond Tyneside, even on Tyneside, who were saying, you know, this is the equivalent of Manchester City's Mark Hughes, the guy who will take them so far before they go out and get a, 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 a Pochettino, a Mourinho, a Guardiola, whatever you want to call it. 
They don't have to. Newcastle have hit with their, sorry, the new owners have hit upon with their very first managerial appointment. They've hit upon a guy who can take them all the way. He is absolutely obsessed with improvement and with betterment. And the biggest compliment I can play him, pay him is the fact that this team, which is playing regularly, week in, week out, six of the 10 starters were already at the club pre-takeover. Six of the 10 starters were players who, supporters of Steve Bruce and, you know, put down as championship players, put down as not being good enough, put down as being the reason the cast United were in a relegation zone. They weren't the problem. Everything else around them was the problem. Eddie Howe has come in and he's taken a lot of those same players. Miguel Almiron, the most informed player in the Premier League. Joe Linton transformed. Fabian Shaw looking like a world-class centre-half all of a sudden. Couldn't get a game previously. He's taken those players and he, he's improved them day on day. He's given them confidence, belief, you know, tactical improvement, technical, technical improvement. He improves players as both footballers and as people and that is as I said before the biggest compliment I can pay him and it's the reason Newcastle are where they are Will uh, will Eddie Howe Craig be someone who puts more emphasis on a top four finish or winning cups because Scrape passed Palace last night on penalties in the, in the League Cup and I think there was a bit of a moment of brevity in one of the press conferences during the week where journalist pointed out that the, the Ferris Cup before the Apollo 11 moon landing in 1969 was their last trophy as a club so I mean Newcastle fans will want trophies and want them fairly soon. How ironic, though, you, you know, previously Newcastle used to rotate in the cup to safeguard against the Premier League status. We were there last night before the game scene. You know, you can understand if they rotate to protect their champion, Champions League ambitions. What a turnaround in a year, the fact that we're, we're having those conversations. But, you know, Eddie, Eddie wants to win a cup, you know, and especially there was a moment last night as the... Uh, as the teams were preparing to take penalties and the scores flashed up on the big board, and I asked this of Eddie afterwards, it revealed that Tottenham, Arsenal and Chelsea had all gone out of the competition. Suddenly, the outcome of that penalty shootout, you know, the, the, the significance of it, w- was amplified somewhat. Newcastle have got a really good chance now. You, there's only Manchester City and Liverpool left in as teams you would probably want to avoid in the in the round of 16s and the round of 16 in the quarterfinals. And there's, there's such a good feel-good factor up here at the moment. There's so much momentum that I think Eddie realises in a season without European football, you know, why not try and use that to propel you into the latter stages of the cup competitions? And he, he really did laugh this week when he was reminded that 35 days after Newcastle United last won a trophy, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, uh, yeah, Newcastle are, are, are reaching for the stars this season, uh, be that you know, a Champions League finish or progress in the League Cup or the FA Cup. And I've got no reason to doubt them or, or, or dissuade them from doing that. So is the break coming at a good time or a bad time? Because it's going to interrupt this momentum. If we're being honest, bad time. It's got to be, you know, what team who has won seven of the last eight matches and is in the, the, the vein of form Newcastle are in, what team can say it, it's a good thing to have a break? On the flip side of that, Newcastle haven't got too many players going to the World Cup, so it's a, it's a five, six-week period for Eddie Howe to, to work with his team you know, on tactics, shape, confidence, technical aspects, everything I spoke about earlier. And if you wanted any manager in the country exposed to his players for a prolonged period of time right now, it would probably be Eddie Howe. You know, so good is he and such an influence and such a difference does he make on the on the training pitch. They're going to go to Saudi during the, uh, the international break for a, for a week or so. And if you remember, the last time they went to Saudi was back in January. They returned from that to win five of six games and propel them to the to the middle of the table. So there's always a positive to be had when, when Eddie Howe is manager. And I think Newcastle have got to really try and seize that. You, you tweeted last night, I think, about the um, extra investments that the owners have made into the club. It's an extra 70 million. I'm not really sure how that works. Is it, um, do they buy shares in it or do they buy from somebody else or do they like issue share capital extra? Is this kind of a way of skirting the financial fair play rules? or is it just kind of how football works? It's just a capital investment and that money will only be uh, taken into account with regards financial fair... Sorry, that money will not be taken into account with regards to financial fair play if it is spent on things like infrastructural costs. Now, at the moment, Newcastle will spend a lot of money on upgrading the, the training ground that wasn't really fit for purpose. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the bulk of that, I imagine, will go with the day-to-day running costs of the club. But, of course, they've also got one eye on January in it. It's going to be really interesting going into January because all the noises coming out of the club at the moment are that they probably they probably won't spend big. They're, they're happy with what they've got. They are restricted by FFP. But if they're going to January in third or fourth position, as, as is looking likely, they might just have a decision to make. And if someone like a James Madison might be available, in actual fact, I don't think he probably will be. I don't think Leicester can afford to sell him for where they are in the league right now. But if that calibre of player did become available at the right price, 
they can act, and I think they might just, if they look at it and think, you know, this could be the little bit of stardust we need to keep us in those Champions League places. If there's if there's a man who epitomises the the turnaround of of, of Newcastle, uh, Craig, it's probably Miguel Almiron. And I know you wrote a piece on him earlier in the week. Um, you know, he went from a laughing stock, as you said, to a goal machine, and it kind of became a, a figure of uh, comic relief for Jack Grealish and others uh, with his performances. And and yet now, you look at this guy, and what was he twenty one million pounds from the MLS a few years mm-hmm. ago? All of a sudden, he is he epitomises all that Eddie Howe is about. It is, yeah. I mean. I will clarify, I didn't use the word laughing stock and copy. Laughing stock <laughs> was on the on the headline, so I do have to in part take ownership of it, but I wouldn't have called him a laughing stock. He was more now so what, when Jack Grealish made the comment playing like Almira on the poke fund his teammate Riyad Mahrez at the, the end of last season, listen, it, it was crass and it was needless. But you did kind of know what he meant, you know. Miguel Almira had almost become a byword for, for aimless endeavours, someone who ran around but didn't really have that, that end product. And I think only Castle supporters and observers, uh, journalists up here like myself would agree with that. Yet what we've seen this season is the the untapping of the, the potential that was probably always there. Miguel Almiron is a player who needs direction, he needs instruction, he needs a good coach. Now, for a period, he had that with Rafa Benitez, and you know he, he did play well, but under Steve Bruce, that just went totally awry. Miguel Almiron was lost at times. He was playing central midfield, and he looked like a player who was headed out of the club. Eddie Howe, as you touched on there, is you know there are two huge success stories in terms of players who uh, were probably headed out with Newcastle, Joel Linton and Miguel Almiron, and right now, what is it, seven goals in seven games, while Jack Grealish sits on the bench for, for Manchester City, so it's certainly... Uh, McQuell, who was having the last laugh at the moment. Uh, the investments, the trip to Saudi, the Saudi under-19, under-20 team coming to play, the links to Saudi Arabia are obviously strengthening as opposed to like anything else that maybe people might have thought, but it doesn't make sense for the links, links to do anything other than strengthen. That's kind of the whole point of the Saudi Investment Fund getting involved here. While the team is riding high like this, I suppose it's difficult for any of the Newcastle fans to really complain too much or is there what's that relationship like at the moment between the fans and the owners and the project and the point of the project well it, it, it's strong it's incredibly strong there's, there's nothing but praise for the owners and I, I guess you're, 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 you're hinting towards other, other concerns over the, the, the identity of the ownership and human rights and everything We've, I've spoken about this on this show with you now and I have to be perfectly honest, I think I gave the same answer the last time. I don't speak on behalf of Newcastle supporters. I'm a journalist up here, but I think I've got a good handle on what they think and what they feel. And they have been able to, the same way as Eddie Howe has been able to, the same way as the players have been able to, they've been able to separate football from politics. And they're looking at this in the isolation as a, of, a, of a football story. And when you look at that, you know, we've just spent five minutes talking about how, how good the atmosphere is, how good a manager Eddie Howe is, the transformation in players and, and all of those sort of positives. Now, that is what supporters are, are, are focusing on and that is what they're enjoying, that is what they're championing. They're enjoying going to the football match in St James's really is a, a special place to watch football and to, to cover football and, and to play football right now. And there really is that, that, that feel-good factor back in the city and... The other issues are there. <clears throat> they do exist. That is a conversation we need to have. It is something we have pressed Eddie Howe on several times. And you know, even myself as a journalist in the city, that every time I write a match report, every time I go to a press conference, I can't address the other issues. Does that mean we're denying them? No, they exist. And when the time is right, we we you know we, we do vigorously pursue them. I want to go to Saudi next month with Newcastle. That, it isn't necessarily an easy thing to do, but you know, I want to go then. I want to ask these questions. I want to have an audience with the guys from, from PIF. So don't think these questions aren't being asked and, and, and these issues aren't being covered. But as I said, we've just spent five minutes talking about the football. So there is another story to tell. And you know, we, we, we've got to do that as journalists up here, especially as it is emerging as a, a quite incredible football story as well. It's a young population in Saudi Arabia as well, Craig, and I think that's something that Newcastle maybe are looking to tap into with, with talk of all these commercial deals as well. There is, yeah, and we sat down with Darren Eels last month for the first time, the chief executive in a, in a box at St James's Park, and we had a chat with him, and he didn't deny the Saudi presence, he didn't try to, to dodge it. If anything, he embraced it. He said, you know, yes, the Saudis are the majority owners of the football club. We will look to 
ex- exploit probably the wrong word, but you know, we will look to take advantage of that that relationship in PIF's kind of connections throughout the world and in Saudi to bring in co- co- commercial partners, increase revenue, find a way around FFP, not by cheating it, by by legitimately bringing in extra commercial revenue, extra monies into the club, so they can invest more in the playing squad and take the club and the team to to, to where they want to be. That that that's fairly obvious, and they didn't try and shy away from that. And I fully expect within the next few months for commercial deals, be it a stadium sponsorship or a shared sponsorship to be announced with, with Saudi partners and for those deals probably to be to be fairly lucrative too. The um the transfer window, this window will be very illustrative. Like if, if those deals are coming down the tracks, you can probably find a way to uh, make them work, make big transfers work if you wanted to with uh, financial fair play given that it's a new financial year obviously as soon as December 31st midnight kicks in so while I mean, if I was in charge of a club I would be saying oh we're not spending any money and then I would do my deal in the side of Liverpool who would never spend any money never ever ever and then they buy players for 70 million like well I thought you weren't going to sign anybody as opposed to Man United who get pressured into massively overpaying for all of their players so it does seem like the, the, the um, intelligence of how to do those deals um, slightly off Broadway is baked into the club at the moment. Yeah, I mean, which club would brief that they were going to spend a load of money going into a transfer window? It, you know, the last two win- Newcastle have had two windows now with new owners, and every time it's been, you know, a limited budget, conservative spend in, in the emerge. They've spent two hundred million pound. Now, listen, what I will say is, t- as much as it's a lot of money, you know, two hundred million pound in very generally doesn't buy you a team that goes from the bottom of the table into the into the top four. They've got to be given credit for A, spending the money they have spent very well in B, as I, as I touched on earlier, improving the players who were already at the at the squad. It's a, it's a, it's a combination of the two is to the reason why Newcastle have enjoyed this incredible turnaround. But what will they do in January? Well you touched on the FFP there, you know, new financial year. It doesn't it doesn't quite work like that. It, it's uh, it's calculated over a three year period. And Newcastle are at the almost the, the very limit of their the FFP expenditure at the moment. Could they go again in January and speculate to accumulate, you know, front load that spending with a view to bringing in bigger, more lucrative sponsors down the line? Well, yes, they could, and if the right deal is there, they, they perhaps will act. But the message at the moment, as it was the previous two windows, and we know what happened, the message at the moment is they're probably not going to spend big in January. I have one last uh, wild card theory for you here, right? Um, let's say the World Cup goes really badly or really well from an England perspective and Gareth Southgate decides, OK, I've had enough. So if he wins it, I'm riding off into the sunset. Mm. Uh, if he goes out in the uh, first round, it's like, well, OK, my time here has come to an end. The obvious candidate at that stage mm. for the England job would be Eddie Howe. Is there a world in which that happens? Mm. Yeah, it would be, absolutely, but uh, it won't happen. You know, I can 99.9% sit here now and say, even if the FA came and, and asked Eddie Howe to be England manager, which I think they probably should, if uh, if Gareth does go, he would say, no, the England job will always be the England job. The England job will be the England job in five years' time, ten years' time. Eddie Howe's still a relatively young man. He's only 44. The Newcastle job, at this moment in time, is unique. It's once in a lifetime. It's the most exciting project in world football. You don't leave the Newcastle job as it is now to go and take over England. That might sound like a crazy thing to hear. I don't know, but it's the truth. And that is how Eddie is thinking at the moment. There's no way he would leave Newcastle for any job in the world right now. I can I can confidently say that I, I, I really can know him and, and speaking to him about this in recent months. So, so yeah, while it is a, a very plausible, likely scenario, uh, it won't happen. So there you go. That's my answer. Craig, uh, the, we wait, wait to see the, the final England squad uh, later, later today, I think. But uh, yeah. interesting to see in the, in the mail, you've had um, yourself and a few of the other columnists picking your, your uh, selected starting 11 for, ahead of the World Cup. So you've gone with 4 2 3 1 Pickford, and then the back four of Trippier, Cody, Stones, Shaw, Rice, mm. and Bellingham in front. Uh, then you've Foden, Madison, Grealish, and Kane. So I suppose what, what jumps out there is. I mean, some people go for, for Dyer, some people go for Maguire, some people go for yeah. Gomez alongside Stones. You've gone for Connor Cody, and you also have James Madison in the team as well. Yeah, so I think there's three players in there who won't be in Gareth's team. I think Gareth's starting 11 is, uh, is probably quite predictable now. The three who from my 11 who won't be in Gareth's 11 will be Connor Cody at the back. That will probably likely be Harry Maguire or uh, Eric Dyer. Jack Grealish won't probably start wide, wide left. That'll be Raheem Sterling. 
and James Madison won't start in that in that role behind the forward. I think it'll probably be Mason Mounder, Bakayo Saka who comes into in, in, into that position or you know mix and match across the front three. Uh, I went for Grealish because I just think he's a different player in an England shirt, and I think Gareth should take the handbrake off uh, and really try to attack this World Cup and play on England's strengths now. Once over, he looked at the England team and thought you could understand why he was building from the back and you know made their strength that that, that solid defensive unit. I don't think it is anymore. I think you might as well go there and attack and make the most of the likes of Phil Ford and Harry Kane. You know, you, you, you're better in your best players. Jude Bellingham pushing on support and that. Uh, I went for Grealish. I just think I think he's a different player in an England shirt. I went for James Madison, who it looks like might not even go to the World Cup, never mind start. I went for him because I just think he, he, he is one of the most informed players in the, the Premier League right now. And I went for Cody at the back, to be honest with you, because I couldn't think of anything else. It wasn't that I particularly think Connor Cody's having a, an excellent season. But when you're asked to do these little things for the for the paper, and I had to pick my England 11, you suddenly realise how short and how stretched they are at the back and how you're probably going to have to put in at least two of the four, three of the four, Kieran Trippier apart who isn't enjoying a good time at club level at the moment in the back four. That is why, I, and you know, to take the, the question on and the subject on, I don't think England will go far in this World Cup. I think they'll probably negotiate the group with a, a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of discomfort, and then the first good team to come up against, be that the last 16 or the quarterfinal, I think they'll, they'll, they'll probably go out. OK, interesting. Very interesting to see who makes the, the grade today in the squad. Craig, always great to talk to you. Happy birthday, sir. Thanks a million for joining us. <laughs> you too, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. It's uh, Craig Hope of the Daily Mail there giving us some thoughts on the situation at Newcastle at the moment. Now, uh, a reminder, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. Every week we give one lucky viewer a €100 Euro voucher to spend on some Braeburn Coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you. To enter, check out Add Off The Ball on Twitter. Like and retweet our Braeburn competition post and you'll be in the draw. Braeburn Coffee never compromises on quality or taste to give you the best on-the-go coffee experience on the road. It's available at Apple Green today. Uh, on uh, Off The Ball Radio today, uh, OTV Gold at one o'clock is Sonia Sullivan. Three o'clock is Leaders' Questions. It's um, Stuart Lancaster interviewing people from the world of business and sport. Our retro panel is uh, Rugby Bombings at four o'clock. And Michael Conlon is OTV Gold speaking to us after his exit in Rio. Um, I was Pretty sensational stuff from Michael Conlon. He's obviously gone on to deliver everything he said he would in the aftermath of that. You can follow off the ball across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in latest sports content. After the break, we're going to be joined by Cork Camogie legend Gemma O'Connor to talk about her new autobiography, Why Not a Warrior? Back after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB GAA. Ross Common is football mad, like. Oh, yeah, they're mental about it. I was sitting in a petrol station last night in Ross Common, and oh, mother of God, the window got tapped three <laughs> times in 10 minutes. They are. That mad. was the one lad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, they're, 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 they're mental about it, yeah. That's Don't go to Rockford now until you win something. Yeah, 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 we'll hold off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Subscribe to the OTB GAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Right, 12 minutes past nine. Uh, JP Wright says Newcastle have the best defence in the league and the back five cost just 65 million. How is a modern coach who has worked wonders with Steve Bruce's flops? I think um, this story is complicated because it's true that all the sports washing is working. Like, oh yeah, yeah. We're, and, we're all of a sudden talking about Newcastle in a football sense. Yeah, and like uh, the sports washing works everywhere. It has worked basically all the time now you know it'll be interesting to see what comes out from the trip to Saudi Arabia um, yeah but I, I, you know does it like do, are more people aware now of the fact that Saudi Arabia has a fairly horrific human rights record than they were before they bought the club is it, is it has it shone a light on it yeah I don't know if it has um, possibly the question does be did asked. Football fans did not care about any of this before. No, Golf fans true. did not care about any of this before. Qatar has definitely highlighted a lot of it. Um, the, the questions were asked of Eddie Howe and he avoided them. Uh, you know, at the start, when he took over Newcastle, I'm seeing lads at, at Monon Town training wearing the green uh, Saudi Newcastle strip who, are, who aren't even Newcastle fans. And they're like... Just like the jersey. Yeah, because they like the jersey. But like they're not really thinking about the fact that this is a this is essentially a Saudi Arabia jersey and, and it, with Newcastle's crest on it. Like... It's become a thing where people, all right, yeah, yeah, geez, that's bad, isn't it? Saudi Arabia are cutting people's heads off with swords. That's terrible. Geez, the jersey's nice, isn't it? Like, it, it, you know, people, football fans are fickle. 
it, it's you forget fairly quickly. Uh, now, obviously, if you're in the media or whatever and you're reading about this all the time and talking to people like Craig Hope who highlight who highlight this all the time, it's more in the, in the periphery of your mind. But yeah, the sports washing with Newcastle is working massively because they're going to, as you said, they're going to Saudi Saudi Arabia on a trip and nobody cares. They're they're starting commercial deals with Saudi companies and nobody really cares. Um, and they're playing really good football and, and that's all that, that football fans really care about so I don't know we're all guilty of turning a blind eye at times um, yeah I think and a lot of people are going to be watching the World Cup and it's hard not to because they made the decision to send it to Qatar anyway we'll come back to this obviously it is um, something that isn't going away anytime soon 14 minutes past 9 this morning we're turning to a new book it's called Why Not a Warrior and it's the story of Gemma O'Connor Cork Camogie legend who is with us now Gemma good morning to you how are you? Morning, I'm good, good. What's the bit where you write the book, you put it in the shops, you tell everybody about it and then you start talking about it again? What's this bit like where you're like, you have to revisit all the stuff that you've written like probably four or five months ago at this stage? Um, yeah, look, to be honest, um, it was fairly, I think it was fairly difficult to get my head around when I was approached to do the book. Um, it was something that I wasn't overly eager to do. I suppose we have to talk about everything. You have to put your trust in somebody that you've kind of that you don't really know when you have to tell every story and then what you know you kind of decide what what goes into the book and um you know i'd be honest the book isn't there to to bad mouth or to go and relive any kind of bad memories or anything like that it's probably trying to portray the best image of of the sport my life um obviously experiences along the way but um yeah it's it's it, it was pretty interesting um it was good to relive some of the memories some of the sporting memories and stuff like that and um you know i suppose that's what I probably found the most interesting about it. Um, yeah, so the, the book is out. Um, it's uh, it's it's not just for people involved in camogie sport. I suppose it's uh, it goes into my personal life. It's 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 probably about life in general, really. Like you know, it's funny, Gemma, because we had Paulie Mara on the show this week, and, and he was talking about writing the book, and he never actually thought about writing the book, and it wasn't something he considered or even wanted to do. But uh, Michael Moynihan had approached him and asked him if if he if he'd do it, and once he'd done it, he found the process cathartic and and quite uh, rewarding like was it something similar for yourself that you got to maybe draw a line under some things and, and remember good times and bad times and, and almost like a therapy process yeah look I suppose in terms of the whole GA world I see myself as kind of a small fish in the pond really and when I retired I suppose I just thought maybe you just fade back into the background um, when you're kind of gone from the inter-county scene you kind of feel like that's it you're gone as well when you're approached, approached to them and put it down into a book put you know um, words onto paper, it's kind of a bit different, but um, yeah, look, I did enjoy it. If I was being that, if I if I'd been honest, I suppose there was times where I kind of felt like, um, you know, maybe I didn't want to do it. Would I pull out of it? Maybe I'm putting too much out there. Um, but yeah, look, I, I did certainly enjoy it, and um, you know, I've only got all positive positive feedback really back. You know, so it's been a it's been a good journey. Which bits did you not want out there? Sorry. Which bits were you thinking? This is too much. Um, it's it, it's not even anything in particular. Well, obviously it goes into my personal life and stuff. And I suppose there's a fine line there between um keeping stuff private and then putting stuff out there. Um, but anything that's really there, I suppose a lot of people would know already. Um, obviously people that don't know me or don't know me personally might not might not not know those stories. But um, like I said, I suppose you know, um it's not like you're this big massive celebrity and you're there trying to sell books uh and and create a story you know you're just like anybody else and i suppose you know delving into your private life is um uh, is quite personal so um yeah i suppose that was probably the thing that um maybe i was a bit reluctant about. yeah because it's not your story alone it's the story of all of the people in your life who you're then putting down in print and going uh, by the way I've I've told a lot of people who we don't know uh, stories about like um, us are you okay with that? Stories about which? You were telling you have to tell stories about your relationship and you're like you're, you have to oh. go down and say listen I've, uh, I've, I'm not sure I got your permission for this but I did it anyway Yeah it's um, yeah I looked at one or two people I was like you know is it okay to talk about this or you know um, so yeah, it's kind of it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting journey, really. Like you know, when you talk, Gemma, even about the the outset of your career in the book, like uh, making that debut against was a Tipperary in two thousand and two. Like you're only maybe seventeen years of age at that time. Like, did you ever foresee that there'd be a career with fourteen All Ireland finals ahead and and so much success? 
Um, I don't, I, you know, anybody that starts off playing sport and has the, you know, the honour, the opportunity to play at a county level or, you know, if you're playing soccer or anything at an international level or whatever it is, you don't really see what the future may hold. You might know you might hold a certain kind of set of skills or talent or that might, you know, might put you on a platform or a pedestal to, to kind of, to to be in position to 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 get to an Ireland finals and and to wear the jersey year after year, but you certainly don't really think that you know you're going to achieve what 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 it, what you what you've achieved. So like I suppose when I t- started out in 2002 as a 17 year old playing um, against Tipperary, I definitely didn't envisage um, what was to come later down the line. All I knew was I wanted to play Camogie. I knew I'd a, I'd a bit of talent and I knew I wanted to work hard for it and then, you know, whatever came, came. But um, it, that's just that's just the, the reality of it, really. And a record 11 All-Stars, which which isn't bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, uh, I suppose, look, it's nice to get individual accolades. You know, when you play in a team sport, it's all about the team. It's all about, obviously, the individual working to the best that they can. And then when everybody does that, it makes for, you know, a, a very successful team. But um, I suppose at the end of it, when, you know, the hurlies are down, when the boots are off and there's um, individual accolades, it's nice to be recognised. And, um, you know, I've been very lucky um, to receive those awards. Uh, the um, decision to write the book and then to go through that process of it, right? What was the bit that you felt like was going to be the most compelling element of your story that you did want to share? Um, I suppose, you know, when we were doing the book and I was talking to um, Sinead Farrell, who wrote the book, and talking to Liam Hayes, so Hero Books, the publisher for Hero Books, I suppose, you know, I suppose the obvious thing as well is, you know, talking about your sexuality and stuff like that. And I have no issue talking about my sexuality. I've been always very open about it. It's something that's just a part of me. It's who I am. I never really saw it as something that I had to, you know, scream at the top of my lungs about. It was just always, it's like anybody else, you know, it's anybody, you know, whether you're straight, um, you're, you, whether, you, you know, if you're in a heterosexual relationship, it's just who you are. And that's the way I always viewed about it. But I suppose it's very different than to talk about it and put it down on the book. Um, and I suppose, you know, that's the fine line, I suppose, about your private life by keeping things personal and about putting it out there. But I suppose when we all sat down and, and spoke about it, you know, I suppose you could be very selfish in, in the way that you might say, look, I don't want to do the book because I don't want to talk about things. But I suppose if by me talking about my sexuality and my experiences might help one or two people out there you know, that are struggling to come out, um, you know, having difficulties with family or friends or people um, that they play with or they just, you know, can't realise basically, you know, that it's it's okay to be who you are. Um, I suppose that's probably the reason why I did speak about it um, because it's very easy just to close off and uh, say, look, I'm not comfortable talking about that. But look, you know, I suppose if I helps one or two people out there, then I suppose I, I, I've gained something in that. Did do you have somebody out there who you were looking up to when you were a kid that you could actually say, okay, somebody has done this before? Because there's, there's an extract of the book that um, you kind of talk about, well, you didn't formally come out, people kind of just knew, your family just kind of knew. It wasn't a, a like a, there wasn't a formal kind of process for you, um, which suggests that you grew up in a really great environment, to be honest. That's the, the first thing that struck me reading that. Yeah, um, look, I've been very lucky, you know, for my family. Um, look, you know, it's not all plain sailing either. It's really, you know, it's not, it's not easy by no means. But, um, but for the majority of everybody in my family, it's been, um, you know, very accepting. Um, you talk about somebody that I looked up to in terms of maybe my sexuality and stuff like that, realizing who I was, and maybe that it was okay. My uncle. John, my mum's brother, um, you know, he, he's gay and my grandparents are always very accepting. You know, people that came from, that were born in the 20s and 30s never questioned his sexuality, which I really kind of looked up to and they just accepted him for who he was. And it was kind of the same for me um, a bit, you know, in, in terms of that. And that's the kind of approach that I took. You know, it's, um, it's something that I kind of wanted to go about in a way, you know, rather than, you know, saying, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I'm just like, but this is who I am. And this is my partner. This is, you know, 
was just a part of life. Um, and look, I'll be honest, there was obviously very difficult things along the way, but um, generally speaking, yeah, I've been very lucky enough in terms of my family. We spoke, Gemma, to Ashling Mara on the show this week and, and she was talking about the, the the survey earlier this year. It was a news talk survey in conjunction with the GPA where um, 714 respondents, so 69% of female players surveyed were aware of a player currently out within their squad. It dropped to just 10% of awareness for male players and she spoke mm-hmm. about being surprised that it was even as high as, as 10%. But do you think there's something within the, the GEA culture or even the pub culture that surrounds it that maybe discourages players to coming out, especially in the male game? Yeah, look, I, I think I, I spoke about that. Um, it's, look, as I said, it's not easy for anybody, male or female. Um, but I suppose there's a, a perception out there that the shock factor is less when women in sport come out. Um, I suppose, you know, if you're, play, you're playing sport, you're, you know, some bit, bit of a tomboyish um, character or the, a tomboyish element to it. And look, don't get me wrong, there's probably, more, you know, there's, there's more straight people, female straight people that I know than, than, um, than gay people out there. Um, but, that, you know, I suppose that, that perception for females in sport is that shock factor is less. In terms of men, um, and I suppose this is probably repeated time and time again, um, you know, men, there's a lot of pressure on men to portray a certain way, you know, to be that alpha male, um, to, you know, play a sport where it's very physical, like hurling or football, you know, especially in the GA culture, um, and, and, and unlike any other sport around the world, you know, rugby, soccer, whatever, but, you know, just in terms of the GA, that what we know, um, you know, it's a manly sport, that's the way it's portrayed. And, you know, the, the pop culture then kind of, um, highlights that or it's uh it's boosted by that by by the egos and by the uh, by the fans of how people are supposed to to act and portray themselves and um i suppose that's the certain that's probably the thing that i probably don't like about it um and as i said it's not that you want people to come out and say oh this is who i am i mean again there's a certain part of your life that you you can be private about and you know nobody can deny that so if there are male um sports people out there in the GA that are gay you know you don't necessarily have to go up and wave your hand and say look this is I'm gay and I'm proud and I know that but it's um it's a lot harder for for male athletes to come out because of those reasons you know it must be rewarding though for you Gemma when you see and you, you spoke about this in the book as well you know even after your wedding getting messages you know from from people on an Instagram you know saying that you're you're you know, thank you for being you, and you've helped me. You know, come out or, or, uh, I guess, speak to family about issues like this. So that must be quite rewarding when you when you get messages like that. Yeah, like uh, you know, I suppose when I, when we're getting ready to get married and stuff like that, and you know, my relationships, I don't really see anything different about it. No, it's, I'm I'm just so used to it. I suppose, but I suppose we forget about people out there, and I suppose people um, take for granted that you know. We still live in a in a society that still thinks that you know these type of relationships aren't the norm, and while we're very lucky to live in a country like Ireland, I suppose there's still people out there that find it hard to come out. And you know, out of the blue, I got a few messages just to say, oh, you know, thank you for for you know putting yourself out there, or you know, thank you for you've really helped my me along the way. And you know, and you know, I don't know these people, and yeah, it, it was really nice to hear that you know, to know that I've probably helped one or two people along the way. And I suppose that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, those chapters were put into the book is to do that, to give, um, you know, some a young girl, a, a young boy, not necessarily young people in their 20s, 30s that are watching this. You know, you have to remember too, that there's a lot of people out there that probably might never come out. So um, it's um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I suppose this is it, this is all about helping people, really. It is interesting, right? Because like ideally, we'd never have to have these conversations, and it wouldn't be a big thing at all. But then, and you think of the progress that we've made as a society from like uh, the decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1993 to marriage equality which you know uh, also in retrospect like why do we all have to have a vote about that why don't we just put it anyway but then there's that clown in Listowel last week 
coming out saying what he's saying and all of a sudden loads of people feel kind of oh well actually you know what uh, he's, uh, there are, there's, a, a, uh, there's definitely a, a congregation and I don't mean specifically in Listowel but there is a congregation of people who still share those uh, dinosaur views and unfortunately we do still need to have these conversations and that's why I think your book is going to be important for people to read and kind of for you just to talk about this normality because like that's exactly what it is yeah, it's, um, you know, the, <laughs> what that priest said was, you know, it's people might seem shocked or, you know, about it that, you know, <laughs> I suppose especially we, li- we live in a society too where if you look, if you f- the flip side of it over is, you know, the whole freedom of speech thing and, you know, people are entitled to say what they say and but when they do, um, you know, people that picked up on it and there's a fine line between it all. But I suppose when you're, when you're sending a message to the community about it, love and respect and about um i suppose christianity is about accepting people no matter what but uh, you know it's um it's a difficult one to to kind of understand um but yeah look i think there are people unfortunately out there um that don't understand it and i think that's okay too i think people have to realize look there are people out there people that the older generation maybe um and obviously people is you know modern mindset people too still have it that might not understand it and i think we have to portray the fact that that's okay too i suppose the important message in this is that you know <clears throat> if you know anybody that's gay or you've a son or daughter or a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or whatever what, what it is that okay it's okay maybe not to understand it but it's so i suppose the important message is to say look you know I still love you. Um, you know, you know, we, we can talk about things. And uh, maybe I don't understand it, or maybe I don't fully accept it. But you know, I suppose the whole key in it is communication and just you know not um, abandoning people or um, kind of you know I suppose um, isolating people. You know, and it's about it's about communication and it's about understanding and it's about you know listening to people and that's probably the key message in um, all of that. You know. Yeah. No. It's a, it's a, the ultimate key message I think people will definitely take away from the book one last thing so you've obviously been involved in Camogie all your life uh, is there a plan into the future to get into coaching and management is that in your future do you think um, certainly um, I suppose <clears throat> since Covid I suppose Covid really was probably the finite time really for me to retire um, that kind of pushed the questions of me which I had um probably a way back um about retirement and I suppose COVID just kind of finished that for me um didn't really have the the support systems or the structures around you know you kind of have to do everything yourself and I think when you get older you kind of need you know you need a physio you need a rehab you need people by your side to do things and I kind of finished that and then I suppose I took a break and getting married was an, was a, a priority because I spent all my life just giving the time to Camogie and nothing for myself or um, to Aoife, to, to my partner or to whoever, like, you know, so it was always about my time in Camogie. And then um, I was doubtful about going back playing club, um, but I back, you know, I went back playing club and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, the time... The time is ticked by, and it's certainly something that I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to getting into in the future. I just think I need to take a bit of time just to um, to enjoy life for maybe the next year, two years, and then I'd love to get stuck back into club coaching, um, maybe, and hopefully into county, get involved at some level. Um, you know, just because you finish playing Camogie doesn't mean you have to close the door completely. So, um, yeah, I definitely would love to get back into it. Uh, Jimmy, you're a member of the Defence Forces as well and, and I know even uh, I remember when you, you retired I was reading a piece the other day Claire Spellman the, the Galway player was talking about coming across you at, at Collins Barracks um, like there th- seems to be a lot of transferable skills there between you know being in a camogie team and being in a, in a, in a unit on the, in the Defence Forces like the, the camaraderie and teamwork you've been around that your entire life it, it seems to be something that's quite transferable Yeah, it's um, it's Look, I suppose every organisation um, has has good things and bad things about it. But you know, my my experience with the defence forces has been nothing but positive, really. And um, you know, I, I joined 
the defence force because I wanted it, you know, something different, um, an outdoor lifestyle. And I knew what the defence forces had an offer, the same thing, you know, teamwork, camaraderie, um, you know, loyalty, commitment and all that. And when you're there, you know, it's it's like playing it's like playing sport when you're in that environment. It's a team environment. You don't do anything necessarily by yourself. Of course, there's, you know, everyone has a specific role or a job, but you're working with people the whole time. And um, whether it's in barracks, whether you're in a training environment, whether you're overseas, you know, you need people around you. And without that teamwork or that camaraderie, it doesn't work. If it fails, and it's the very same then on the pitch with Kamoli, you know, in sport, it's all transferable. So um, they go they certainly go hand in hand. And um, I've been very fortunate to experience both. And I think it's kind of, you know, it stood by me um, and it's uh, it's something I would definitely recommend to people that have any interest in the outdoors life and sport you know you can play sport in the defence forces as well you know there's um, a massive uh, drive for that there so um, yeah look it's uh, it's those characteristics definitely go hand in hand and I, I, I've only gained nothing but um, but positivity from it and uh, it's uh it's definitely uh, a good career to take. Uh, one last one, sorry. Uh, where did the name of the book, it's Why Not a Warrior, where did that come from? Um, well, it was kind of something that um, Liam and Sinead kind of thought up of. And um, I suppose they just looked at my whole life, my life experiences and, you know, being uh, being a camogie player, intercounty camogie player for so long, the experiences that I went through, I suppose, you know, in terms of my sexuality, my, um, you know, you talk about um, your home life, you know, the people that you've lost, um, my experiences in the army, and they put all that together, and I suppose that's what they came up with, you know, and that's where the, the that that um that title came from. So you know, they asked me, was I was I okay with that? I just said, look, I, I trust you. You're the people. You're the experts. So um, you know, I suppose that's that's. That's why he was chosen by not a warrior. Well, listen, we wish you the very best of luck with it. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. I appreciate it. Thanks a million for having me. Thank you. No worries. It's uh, Gemma O'Connor. The book, as I said, is called Why Not a Warrior and it's available now in all bookstores. It's 9.35 uh, on the show tomorrow. Ron O'Gara is going to join yourself and Shane. Ron in the papers today talking about, yeah, the England job. Yeah, definitely interested in that. <laughs> definitely interested in that. Dropping grenades. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I think I'd be able to find a way to make those two out work together. Obviously, um, I've got a very, uh, I love my job now. Yeah, but, yeah. You know. Always interested, Ron, and he's got the disciplinary procedures to go through the minute in France as well so uh, always always fascinating but yeah the England stuff is never going to go away is it these links yeah, well specifically obviously he's in uh, London for the Babas game Scott Robertson also said yes I'd love to manage England but yeah. I mean I would prefer the All Blacks but England you know if I have to I'll take that job too very good job so when in London when in London exactly. surrounded by English journalists you gotta, you gotta like give them a, a little <laughs> scratch under the chins there oh yeah, yeah I love, I love yeah. great job great but job, at yeah. the same time you know it's, uh, it's not not bad uh, negotiation skills. Uh, right, the Welsh FA Chief Executive, you met him recently? Yeah, Noel Mooney. So I was sat down with, with himself uh, last week in the Market Hotel in Dublin. So it was Neville Tithall and Ian Rush. Those, in, those interviews are up on uh, the YouTube and the podcast as, uh, as well already. But uh, yeah, Noel, fascinating background, obviously, with the FAI. He's now the head guy with the uh, Football Association of Wales. So kind of spoke about the... Iran, the awkwardness of Iran being in their group. Um, the Ukraine FA have called for Iran to be pulled out of the World Cup, essentially. So I asked him about that, given Wales are in the same group. Um, he fancies their chances as well in the group. A little bit of confidence there, just like Neville Southall. Uh, and then, of course, just the, the, mor- the moral issues around going to the World Cup in the first place. So, yeah, interesting chat with Noel Mooney. OTBAM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Here's Shane in conversation with Noel Mooney. Enjoy. All right, I am delighted to be joined here on uh, OTB AM now by uh, Noel Mooney, the Chief Executive Officer of the Welsh FA, formerly of the FAI, of course, and, and former League of Ireland goalkeeper, I should say, as well. Indeed, yeah. Um, so we've got, we've got the Welsh, the Welsh uh, livery behind us here, and uh, you're, you're, one of the things that, that struck me this week, Noel, is um, wanting to change the name of Wales when it comes to football to, to Kimlu, so the, the, the Welsh name for it. So this is something that, that's been in the works for a while, has it? Well, I moved to Cymru uh, last summer uh, to become the CEO of the Football Association of Wales. Um, And what I was pleasantly surprised about was the Renaissance in Cymru, the Welsh language. Uh, It's spoken on the streets around where I live, in the coffee shops and that as well. And the FAW has been kind of to the forefront of bilingualism. 
um, and encouraging the growth of the language. The reason we're here uh, these days is to celebrate the uh, agreement between and between the Welsh Government and the Irish Government over the next five years in terms of trade and different things. But the language is very important to the Welsh Government. They've got a target of a million Cymraic speakers by 2050. Uh, the FAW have an agreement with the National Centre for Learning Cymraic whereby our staff and the 950 clubs that we have across the country uh, have the opportunity to learn Cymraic. And you can feel it growing. It's a really strong renaissance, a bit like Ireland, I suppose, through the Gale schools, through the Welsh medium schools, and that um, the Welsh language is really going through a rebirth. So we are called Cymru uh, in Cymru. Uh, <laughs> and also, I mean, for, for example, rugby, um, um, Wales play against New Zealand, uh, the All Blacks, over the weekend. And if you look at the social media in that from the, the rugby union, that's that's Cymru against the All yeah. Blacks. So it's not unusual, as Tom Jones would say, to call ourselves Cymru at home. The question is, obviously, we're going to the World Cup finals, which you know, we'll have five billion people watching us. The question that was raised a while back was, when you're watching on TV and it says we're playing USA, for example, should it be WAL? Or should it be CYM when you when you look at the ticker tape or on the yeah. left hand corner of the screen, and you see? So, like, it's something that we're interested in just debating is the best way of putting it. So at home we're called Cymru. That's what the teams are known. Yeah. All of our national teams are called Cymru. So it feels natural to call ourselves Cymru abroad. But we have to be mindful that the world knows us as Wales. You know, so it's how we do that. But again, it's a debate we'll have. It's one we discuss with the government, we discuss with the players, discuss with the fans, discuss with the clubs. And next year, I think we'll have a discussion around it and see where it takes us. But we should be open. I mean, we're a bilingual nation, uh, and therefore we should consider, you know, the best use of that bilingualism when the, when the chances occur. I suppose the, the FEI in Ireland will be looking at this as well as something that maybe you could adopt more and get into the Irish language a little bit more. Um, the Euro 2028 bid, Joint bid, I guess, is yeah. is, uh, is another one that's that's on the table at the minute, and I know Turkey, other the competitors, um, and a lot of things at play here in terms of who's going to get get picked. You, you you're calling for the first game to be in Cardiff, for example, but but what's your what's your feeling in terms of the likelihood of England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland getting getting this bid over the line? Well, first of all, I think it's a great bid. I mean, just having the five nations together. Uh, on the two islands together in the way we are. We work really well together. There's a great um, spirit amongst the board of that bid, which is the five CEOs, mm. and the others, like the governments that are involved. The governments here uh, in Ireland is fantastic supporters of the tournament, I have to say, as is the UK government, as is the Welsh uh, devolved government. So everyone is together. In, in Cymru, we have got this saying, together stronger, which is very much the bond between all of us in Welsh football. But the bid feels like it's together stronger as well, that we feel that we've got a really good proposition in every way, whether it's supporters, whether it's a commercial bid, whether it's the stadia. You know, we've got so much to, to offer. We believe it's an extremely strong bid that would be, you know, the best Euro ever. Um, so, you know, we've just put our best foot forward, um, make sure that UEFA have a lot to think about um, in terms of why they wouldn't give it to us, I suppose. There's a timeline. Is, is there a timeline on when the bid will be yeah, announced? Yeah. So we'll know by next autumn okay. um, whether we're successful or not. But there's different steps in the process. So the, the dossier has gone in. We've submitted all of our information to UEFA. Um, and then you get some feedback. I mean, tomorrow, for example, we've got a meeting of the steering group, uh, which is the five CEOs, to go through more detail. And there's lots of details we worked out, but the broad strokes are all in place. We know uh, essentially where the games would be played, certainly um, um, in, yeah, we, we have a good sense of where the games would be played. Uh, there's a bit of jockeying to be done between the federations on details, but that's okay. Uh, once we win the bid and are successful, we'll figure it all out together. Well, I guess the, 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 one of the issues as well, I, I think at this stage anyway, it's, it's down to be a 24 team Euros as opposed yeah. to bringing it to a 32 team Euros. So the number of host teams that automatically get qualifying is, is yeah. another issue. Like is the, has there been any discussion on that? I, I, I'd imagine all five aren't going to automatically qualify, so there has to be some discussion around how that works. Yeah, I mean, we discuss that all the time. Um, you know, all the different headings, um, you know, the stadiums that are going to be used. But for the qualification, I mean, you're not going to get, I'd imagine, five automatic qualification spots. If you get that, that's fantastic. Um, but I don't think it'll work like that. So, you know, I don't know, would you be aiming for, for, for less than five mm. uh, and more than one? Um, and then you've got to work out the criteria if 
Um, hopefully we all qualify, firstly. I think I have to say that. Uh, it's 24 teams at the moment. Um, hopefully we all qualify. We've qualified for the last two Euros, of course. Um, so there's a lot of confidence that we should keep qualifying for these tournaments. But if we don't, the fallback position of these automatic qualification places would be important. And then we've got to agree between us the number uh, and the criteria for getting them spots, of course. So that's going to be a, a bun fight, I presume, between us all. But it'll be done in the right spirit, which everything around this bid has been done so far. Well, fingers crossed we get that, that bid certainly over the line. Um, look, look, as, I, as I mentioned, look, you're, you're mm -hmm. formerly of the, the Football Association yeah. of Ireland and, of course, bouncing over then to, to, to Wales, so plenty of experience there. But uh, and I guess a lot of people, the FBI trying to move on from, from the previous yeah. John Delaney era. Uh, like when, you, when you look back now at, at that time, and maybe where the FAI is at now as, a, as an organisation and trying to move on and look, the women's team qualifying for the World Cup and so yeah. many positive things. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on how, how the FAI has maybe developed from that uh, admittedly terrible era to, to now, essentially? Yeah, well, but first I'd let the FAI talk about how they're doing, to be frank. Um, I've got my hands full with managing Welsh football. I have enough to worry about uh, in Cymru. Um, so I let the FAI speak for how they, they are progressing. But from seeing the um, women get to the World Cup finals was fantastic. Obviously, I was here when uh, we appointed Vera Powell as the manager, um, and that was a big decision because at the time there was a lot happening. Uh, there was a lot of issues to solve, and in, in the middle of all of that, mm. uh, we had to appoint uh, a manager for the women's national team, uh, and the selection has proved to work out pretty well. Yeah. Um, and look, it's just been fantastic to see the crowds growing. Uh, for women's football generally, by the way, I mean, you saw with ourselves, we played a playoff match the other night in Cardiff, there was 15,200 people right. to see our women's national team play. So it's growing so quickly. We've got uh, a fantastic squad, but unfortunately we were beaten by Switzerland the last kick of the ball in extra time in the playoff. But we're really comfortable that we're going the right direction in Cymru, that our team, um, our women's national team is really good. Um, and, you know, we've... We've got a side that's growing, so I think we'll qualify for lots of tournaments over the next few years, uh, and hopefully we can fill the stadium. I mean, our stadium in Cardiff City is 33,000 seats. We can fill it now for the men, okay, against Ukraine and Austria for our, quali for our playoffs, where you couldn't, you, know, you couldn't get a seat. Uh, but for the women's team, we're at over 15,000. And I think if we come to a, a night in Cardiff where we're aiming to qualify for Euro 25, I think we'll fill the stadium. I really believe right. that. And that's our big goal in the next campaign is to fill the stadium completely for a women's international um, and to just show the massive progress and to build upon the massive progress we made in the last campaign. Yeah, and that, I think that's the conversation that's happening here as well in terms of, you know, filling Tala Stadium, Definitely. getting a friendly in the Definitely. Aviva Stadium, all the rest. And, and even, you know, seeing things like, you know, players' faces on billboards and buses and that sort yeah. of stuff it's it's clearly increased in, in interest and intrigue for, for many people I guess like Liberty Hall was it's hard to believe it's five years ago now but yeah. it, that's probably the when you look at Irish women's football it's probably the yeah. line in the sand turning point from before then and, and after then like that, did, did it feel like a colossal moment for you back back then five years back ago then, back then I was in UEFA I remember seeing it um, and you know it certainly didn't read well um, that's for sure um, but at that stage, um, you know, the women's game, and even still, there's issues coming up in the women's game. We're always looking for equality and everything. Um, still, there's new issues emerging all of the time mm. that you have to keep responding to and that till we get to a place where... And there's different issues, by the way. I mean, there's certain things. For example, even with us, um, the men's players all have boot deals. The women's players don't have boot right. deals, so we have to give them extra boot deals. We have extra support we have to give them. We have extra staff in around the women's camp that the men don't have. Mm. So it's, it's a mix of everything, to be honest with you. Uh, the equal pay is obviously a big issue, of course. Uh, making sure that they've got the same charter flights, as all of them things, which thankfully we've all moved a million miles on from. And I think if you look at the Irish squad, they look so happy. They, they've earned what they've got going to the World Cup finals. Women's football, women's sport is in a good place, but women's football is just explosive. Any sponsor that comes into me now to talk about Welsh football, even though the men's team is going to the World Cup finals, mm. the first thing they ask me about is the women's game. Right. Yeah, the yeah. Like the commercialisation of the women's game will see lots of benefits coming to, um, to the athletes, which you should get. But also even in terms of salaries of managers and different things, mm. the salary benchmark for women will grow quite quickly as the... Um, commercialization, the TV rights, and that grows, um, you know, we'll end up paying a lot more. But it's great because it means that people want to watch 
women's football so much now. I have to say, I think the English Women's Super League is fantastic. Yeah. I've watched it a bit over the weekend. Uh, and the way uh, the broadcasters have taken that forward, and the way the sponsors have taken it forward, and the way that uh, the people behind the tournament have taken it forward is absolutely fantastic. So it's like a race to the top, thankfully, yeah. for everybody. So if you look back at Liberty Hall, them pains were being felt not just in Ireland, but in many countries across Europe. It feels very much, certainly like in, in Western Europe, certainly, and I think increasingly across all of UEFA countries, that it's moving on at a million miles an hour, and it's just fantastic. Um, when you look at, uh, and you mentioned, look, Wales qualifying for the, this World Cup, uh, yeah. and first time since 1958, which is an extraordinary achievement, um, and we watch them closely, but uh, there, there's the, the issue for, for every football association that that's involved with yeah. Qatar and, and the, the human rights abuses and the LGBTQ plus issues, and migrant deaths and you know the list goes on in terms of uh, what, what's happening here over there in Qatar like w w does it sit uneasily with you as, as, as a chairperson of one of the associations involved like it's you, you guys are put in a difficult situation in that you're, you've qualified for the tournament and yet there's so much negative uh, word around this tournament and rightly so I guess a lot of people would, would say well the first thing is uh, when I was at UEFA you know the before I came to to Cymru, a working group had been set up for the countries that were qualifying for the World Cup finals. So you'd have had the ones early doors, like the French, the English, the Germans, the Dutch were in quite mm. early because they qualified through their groups. So that working group was set up to interface with the Qatar Supreme Council uh, and the various bodies like FIFA, of course, um, who are the organizers of the tournament. So I, was, I felt good that I knew the early meetings between the UEFA working group and FIFA and uh, the Qataris. Now, what we did know, uh, that there was legislative development in the country, you know, the ending of the kafala system and different things, that, was, that we knew was positive. But what was important to think about, what was the pr principle for us, when we're thinking we qualify, we beat Ukraine to qualify for um, the World Cup finals, and immediately your mind goes, okay, we're going to the World Cup finals, there's gonna be you know, a spotlight shone on the region. So what we thought about was, okay, could we use this tournament as a chance to use this beautiful game that we have to improve the world and to make the world better? Or do we just all turn our backs on everybody and just become exclusionary? So our view very much was, like the other UEFA nations, was, okay, let's go in with the various bodies, like the International Labour Organization, the likes of Amnesty and that, sit down with people and use this as an opportunity to really, you know, to, to move things forward. Um, and what's important is, I mean, to be fair to the Qataris, what they're saying is they want to use this period of discussion and debate and examination um, to become leaders in their own region. That's what they want to be. Now, our experience so far, there's a number of issues that we're looking at, as you quite rightly mentioned, migrant workers is a big issue. You know, we've called upon, um, we've called for that migrant centre. That migrant centre is quite a simple concept to me. It's basically, many years ago, our ancestors went to New York, Boston, Sydney, uh, London. Uh, and when they arrived there, you know, to understand, especially as different language in some cases, for these people arriving in Qatar, you know, to have information about what forms to fill up, you know, what they can do in the country, you know, what the laws are and that, it's quite confusing for people. So the migrant centre is basically an information centre for migrants to understand what their rights are and all that kind of stuff. Then there's the compensation fund, as you know, which we don't know how that's landed, but that's a call for yeah. us. And then the other thing from us as well, that we want to engage with people, we've come up with the concept of the One Love armband, which is a, a rainbow coloured armband, which is about um, showing solidarity with the LGBTQ community. We've got a rainbow wall in Cymru um, that is very special to us. So we have put out our statements, the Welsh governments have a value statement as well, and it's really trying to use this tournament, which is absolutely our aim, to use as a platform for improvement, rather than criticising all of the time. Yes, we're criticising, yeah. we should, but we should use it as a platform. And I must say, the meetings I've been at with the Qataris has shown uh, propensity for improving things. Yeah, and, and, and like when you say, look, the Qataris obviously want to be seen to be world leaders. Like a, a lot of people argue, they can be world leaders by improving these things yeah. straight away by, yeah. by improving women's rights and LGBT rights. And a lot of people would argue that they're not doing enough uh, as things stand. Like, yeah. and I know from your perspective, like I, I look at things like the Australian FA releasing the video with the players yeah. and kind of pointing out all these issues. Like, yeah. uh, some people argue, and you know, there, there's an opportunity there for, for different countries, every country at the World Cup, to, to do something. Now, that's something, I don't know what that is, yeah. but to stand up and, and maybe, like, have the, have the Welsh FA had any thoughts or, or ideas or meetings even about 
maybe doing something that, that people talk about. Uh, you know, like a, a Jesse Owens moment. You know, something that people look back on years to come and go, OK, they were highlighting serious issues in, in the country that hosted the, the World Cup. Yeah, I mean, we had to look at our approach towards it. So we worked with the Welsh Government um, and they've got a piece of legislation called the Wellbeing of Future Generations, which is a brilliant piece of legislation, which is basically about sustainability of Cymru going forward. Um, so we spent a lot of time debating this with them and they've created, the government themselves, a value statement on Cymru to the world, uh, basically, which them values are pretty clear. I mean, if you read the document, it's really clear what we believe is right. Um, but we also did agree all together that we would use this as an opportunity for dialogue. We don't particularly want it to become a beauty pageant of who does the most yeah. fantastic protest. I mean, I, you know, that's up to each country to decide what they want to do themselves. We're also very laissez-faire with the players. So if the players decide they want to do something, no problem. We'll, you know, we talk to the leadership group of the players uh, very regularly, every single camp, about their views on how we're developing. And what you have to um, consider is that in Cymru, the FAW is seen to the forefront of um, cultural progress as a country that is becoming increasingly confident, increasingly agile. And one of the things I always think about is, you know, having grown up in the west of Ireland, you know, what Jack brought to us as a, as a country yeah. on the world stage with that magnificent group of players where we got to Euro, 20, or Euro 1988 and beat the English in Stuttgart. And that kicked off, you know, I mean, there's certain studies done about the link towards the Celtic Tiger. I'm not altogether sure how <laughs> exact science there is behind that. Yeah. But we do know that it made us, a, it certainly embedded an extra confidence and a layer of pride in being Irish. Now, with the success of this group, since 2016, getting to the semi-finals in their first tournament in many years, uh, getting to the semi-finals of the tournament, getting to Euro 2020 and coming out of the group, now getting to the first World Cup in 64 years. Mm -hmm. There's a real buoyancy amongst the group. There's a real togetherness amongst that group. They know what they're doing for us as a country on the world stage. So going to Qatar, they're quite deep, these guys. They're quite connected to social issues. When they arrive in on the 13th and 14th of November, because we're heading over on the 15th, there will be a discussion on you know, how do we approach it with them. Yeah. When they go off and play for the clubs, we've got one player in Los Angeles, we've got one player in France, we've got many players across England, Germany, mm -hmm. different places. I mean, they don't meet on teams every night to discuss this stuff, so they don't see each other all the time. Yeah. It's when they come into camp, they might have certain ideas that they'll discuss together. But as an association, we are very connected to social issues. As I say, in Cymru, we'd be seen as very much a leader in bilingualism, in sustainability, in equality, diversity, inclusion, how society, in our view, should be, um, should, you know, should evolve. So going to Qatar, we've got a number of things that we're already working on, like our, our own statement, we've, which we've put out. Uh, yesterday, for example, at a meeting with the First Minister, uh, Mark Drakeford of the TUC, which is, you know, a huge union, global union, who outlined to us the improvements that Qatar have made, it, as I say, in legislative development. They've shown us the figures, for example, of migrant workers that back in 2019 couldn't move job. And now you've got hundreds of thousands who conflict between jobs and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's improvement being made. The question is the speed of improvement. And certainly when we go to Qatar, there'll be plenty of meetings around the tournament where that discussion will go on. The UEFA Working Group is our Klingon, because the UEFA Working Group is the 13 or so nations from Europe that are playing in the World Cup finals. That's the working group that has the power. That's the one that's engaging with the Qataris and with FIFA. And that's made a lot of progress. And I think after the tournament, we have to continue with that. It's yeah. not just the tournament comes and it's gone. There has to be a legacy of the tournament. And to be fair, the meetings I've been at and having met the, the Qataris and met FIFA on them, there is a real spirit of progress there. Um, and I think over the next couple of weeks, the rhetoric and the talk around Qatar will hot up. We're very conscious of that, uh, for sure. But we've got our own way of communicating, we've got our own way of, um, of bringing things forward. We're confident that we're in the right, um, the right lane. Very finally, Noel, and you've been very good with your, with your time. Um, like you have England and, and USA and, and Iran, and I guess Iran are the, the ones that have been making the headlines in the last week. You've had the Ukrainian FA calling for their expulsion from the World Cup. Um, I can't leave you guys in an awkward position that you're, you're in the same group as the Iranians uh, and this is all of course to do with I guess the, war, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Iranian support um, like, like, does, does it lead to any awkward questions? Have you had to had, have any meetings with this? I guess the question is the, the English FA, the Welsh FA and the, the American Folk Soccer Association are going to have to decide, you know, is there any way we can have solidarity with the Ukrainian FA on, on these issues because no doubt they want the Iranians not to take part in this tournament whatsoever. 
Well, we've gone through this for many months, obviously, since the invasion of Ukraine, which all of us felt desperately sad about. And the solidarity with the Ukrainians has been really strong, of course. Um, we played them uh, to qualify for the mm. World Cup finals. There was all the debate before our playoffs that we felt that they should have got a place through to the World Cup. Ukraine, we discussed that with FIFA. We, we discussed things like that. In the end, we played off and they obviously beat Scotland, came to Cardiff and, and fortunately for us, certainly, that we managed to qualify for the World Cup finals. But, but um, the president of the Ukraine FA, Andrew Pavelko, I would know very well from my time at UEFA, I felt desperately sorry for him on the day. I could see the tears in his eyes because yeah. he knew for his own country what that would have done for Ukraine. Uh, to get to World Cup finals, what statement that would have made if Ukraine had been going to the World Cup finals. But obviously we had a job to do. We're uh, you know, a country that wanted to be at a World Cup finals. We hadn't been there for 64 years, so the players were very focused on getting Cymru to a World Cup finals, which thankfully they did. Now, since then, of course, you know, we've all uh, worked very closely with Ukraine on all sorts of issues to demonstrate solidarity and our togetherness and our brotherhood um, with the Ukrainians. Uh, I heard about the letter. Um, going to FIFA from the Ukrainian FA. I've had no contact from FIFA, from the Ukrainian FA or anybody um, with regards to Iran. But what I can say is that we've had discussions with the Welsh Government about our approach uh, to the match with Iran. So we're kind of in a wait and see mode on Iran, watching to see what develops. We keep our finger on the pulse of how it all goes. But um, to you know, we've got the two sides, we've got to prepare to go to World Cup finals and all the technical analysis of the different teams that we're playing against, how are we going to unlock them and how are we going to get the results we need to get out of the group, of course. So the technical team is very focused on playing USA, Iran and England. From my side and from the association's board side, we've got to keep watching that situation to see how it evolves. Today, I don't, you know, at the moment, I don't see any other result than us playing Iran on the day that we're slated to play against them. I don't see any change to that. I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, but um, watch this space. Listen, Noel Mooney, CEO of the Welsh FA, thanks a million for your time. Gareth Margaret. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Barrett for 